Testing. Honey, give us this. Honey, give us this. Let's see about it. Oh, yeah, exactly. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Oh, I think it's okay. Hey, it really picks it the right seat. All of the ways. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, everybody, let's have a seat. Ready? Where's Doug? Thank you, sir. That was for Mr. Rex. We heard that one, all right? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? All right. Can I go now? I call to order the Board of Directors of Dr. Cog, Wednesday, October 16th. If you'd all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, Air Force! Uh, off we go into the wild blue yonder. <laughs> all right, good evening, everybody. Uh, can I have a roll call? Eva Henry? Here. Jeff Baker? Here. Who's Elise first? Jones? Here. David Beacom? Here. Randy Wheelock? Here. Nicholas Williams? Here. Kevin Flynn? Here. Roger Partridge? Laura Thomas? Ron Engels? Libby Zabo? Bob Pfeiffer? Here. Bob Roth? Allison Hilt? Larry Vidham? Here. David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Margo Ramsden, here. Ben Baca, Matt Johnston, Roger Hudson, Ben Price, George Teal, Tammy Bauer, here. Jeremy Fay, Randy Wheel, here. Richard Champ, Bill Christie, Jackie Thomas, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, here. Linda Olson, okay. Bill Gipp, Daniel Dick, Lee Peterson, Bobby Sindelar, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Rachel Binkley, Here. Jim Dale, Here. Ron Rakowski, George Lance, Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Dana Gutwein, Here. Karina Elrod, Kyle Schlachter, Larry Strock, Wynn Shaw. Here. John Peck. Ashley Stolzman. Here. Connie Sullivan. Barney Drystadt. Joyce Palazuski. Paul Sutton. Here. Chris Larson. Julie Mullica. Joyce Downing. John Dyack. Here. Kelly Daigle. Dave Black. Andy Hammerly. Jessica Sand. Herb Atchison. John Volt. Bud Starker. Adam Zarin, Rebecca White, here. Bill Van Meter, here. Apparently started earlier than Connie was ready for me to start. So, um, some I would like to make an announcement tonight that uh, some of the directors that's going to be their last meeting, I believe, is tonight, right, Connie? And I want to recognize Mayor Pro Tem Rick Teeter. Yeah, you're more than welcome to have the floor. Okay. Do, there we are. You know, I decided I did not want to be for mayor, and I'm not going to run for mayor. Oh, five I people jumped in the race. It's a <laughs> nightmare over there. <laughs> uh, the next person I didn't 
here, but it was Mayor Daniel Dick, uh, F Federal Heights. So let's just give him a round of applause. Yeah. And also, it's Mayor Ron Rakowski's uh, last meeting from Greenwood Village. Microphone to the mayor. Thank you. Yes, sir. Am I? Okay. Yes, no, I'm not. Uh, thank you very much, folks. The feeling is mutual, and I'll be real short. 1959, <laughs> I went to my first meeting with the councilman for a subject I don't remember. I was in ninth grade, <laughs> and here I am today. The other point is, thanks to the situs of my birth, moving around the country, thanks to Uncle Sam, I've lived in virtually every quadrant of the country. Southern California, Texas, Florida, everywhere but in the Midwest. What we have here, we have collaboration is very, very special. And I was involved with local government everywhere I went. So we decided to stay here and settle here. And I think the decision, great one. I want to thank you all for your, what you do for our region. Salute you for what you do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, I kind of went out of order on our agenda, so I apologize. Moving to item number four, move to approve the agenda. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? That carries. We'll move on to uh, item number five, the community spotlight. The city and county of Broomfield, I believe that is Sarah Grant, is here. From She is the transportation manager. And Fonda Buckles, the senior services manager. On up. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members of the board. Um, again, I am Sarah Grant, Transportation Manager for the City and County of Broomfield, and I have Fonda Buckles here, um, ser Senior Services Manager, and also in the audience we have Lane Claxton, a Program Manager for City and County of Broomfield. Um, I am going to give you a few quick facts and introduction to Broomfield, and then I'm going to turn it over to Fonda to tell us a little bit more about how Broomfield has used the Dr. Cog Boomer Bond Assessment Tool, um, completed a successful aging study, and um, our Easy Ride Transportation Program for seniors and um, adults with disabilities. Um, this is the city and county of Broomfield. Uh, we uh, currently have about 70,000 residents, uh, 30, covering 33 square miles and about 30,000 housing units. We're situated between I-25 and US-36, um, north and south, and connecting us east-west is State Highway 128, um, 120th Avenue, and Northwest Parkway. Another major arterial running through our community is US-287, um, from US-36 headed north towards Longmont. Uh, we are surrounded by uh, four counties, uh, Adams County, Boulder County, uh, Jefferson, and Weld. Um, so we have a lot of neighbors. Um, some facts about City and County of Broomfield is that we have 200 miles of streets, but also 290 miles of walking and bicycling paths and trails, including wide sidewalks on our major arterials. Um, we have 8,000 acres of private and public open lands, 63 parks, and we have uh, five um, school districts, so it's a great place to live and a great place for families. Um, this is a quick overview of um, the development going on in Broomfield, which I'm sure is happening in a lot of your communities. Um, this is kind of the southern portion of Broomfield, and this is all to say these are just the residential projects that are going on in our community. This is along the US 36 corridor and um, central Broomfield. 
Um, I also wanted to highlight um, the development going along in the northern part of Broomfield, um, State Highway 7 to the north at I-25. Um, this is a major area where we're seeing a lot of growth and development, um, major commercial development, lots of residential coming in, um, schools, hospitals, medical and office coming in the near future. And we're working with our corridor partners along the corridor from Brighton to Boulder, so eight communities in total to uh, fulfill a vision of a multimodal connected corridor um, for transit transit, bikes, and for vehicles. Um, this is uh, just highlighting again our um, commercial areas. Um, so we're really focused on development and growth along um, for our commercial areas along US 36 and the I-25 State Highway 7 area, which is consistent with the Dr. Cog um, urban center areas. And a little bit of a regional context, um, our Broom Broomfield employees I'm sorry, <laughs> Broomfield residents um, that are employed, 86% um, of them actually work outside of Broomfield. Um, and then in the opposite, um, Broomfield employees who live outside, 88% of them live outside of the Broomfield. So we have a lot going on with commuting in our community. So transportation is super important to us. Um, and to that end, we in 2016, we updated our comp plan um, and adopted a transportation vision um, that is multimodal and um, supports people of all ages and abilities. And so with all ages and abilities is a really good segue to hand it over to Fonda Buckles, which will talk about um, our boomer assessment, and boomer bond assessment tool and successful aging study. Thank you. This one here? All right, well boy, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for highlighting the city and county of Broomfield. So I wanna talk a little bit briefly about our successful aging study. The successful aging study came out of Dr. Cog's Boomer Bond Assessment in 2018. And so what we were able to do, we took a vast amount of stakeholders and we came together and looked at our successes and some of our opportunities for our older adults, really with the main focus on how do we support healthy, healthy aging and living in the city and county of Broomfield. And also one thing I wanna highlight, I'll go back to that slide, is not only did we complete that Boomer Bond assessment tool, what a wonderful tool it was, but we also were able to put a viable action plan into place. And that action plan is a fluid document. We have so many wonderful partnerships within the city and county of Broomfield right now. But as far as this presentation, with the limited time we have, I'm only gonna talk about Easy Ride. So as you guys look, as far as the population, again, all of you guys are experiencing that growth. Overall, in the last 18 years, we've had a 3% growth in the city and county of Broomfield. But if you look at our population of 60 plus, we're looking at an 8% annual growth. Now this one's even a little bit bigger. If you look here, by 2015, in the city and county of Broomfield, um, we're gonna have 30% of our population being 60 plus. So back to the successful aging study, what we did when we um, focused, we took the Boomer Bond assessment, we focused on three priorities. We looked at mobility and access, community living, and support services. One of the things that we came out of, one of our successes is our Easy Ride program. And thanks to Dr. Cog, we get a great deal of support to sp provide this wonderful service that we have. Easy Ride is a program that we offer for our residents 60 or plus or adults with disabilities. And as you can see on the board, most of right now, we're hit hitting about 85% of our trips with medical nutrition and wellness. Right now, um, with the growth that we're seeing, as you, I just um, highlighted the statistics of our growth, we've seen in the last five years, just with trips alone, an 18% growth. From 18 to, to, to the projected of 2019, we're looking at another um, projected growth of 11% in our trips that we're providing. If you look at our passengers, again, in the last five years, not as big of a growth of looking at 5%, but in the last year, we have a, project, a projected 12% increase. Right now, we have six dedicated vehicles out in operation on a daily basis, unless one is in for um, service or anything like that. One of the things that I highlight, and I feel that our program is so successful for with the Easy Ride, is because of our partnerships and our collaboration with this, um, not only with the city and county of Broomfield, but our partners outside. We have Senior Resource Center. They have a volunteer driving program that if we can't provide a trip, then we can give them a call to say, hey, I have a resident that needs to be outside 
uh, the, um, let's say a St. Joe's Hospital or whatever it may be. That collaboration goes bro both ways. We have Flex Ride. Len, one thing, and I don't know how many of you are in the transit, but it is much easier to accept a trip than to deny a trip. And the reason why I say that is we take so much effort to deny a trip. We don't just deny a trip in the city and county of Broomfield with Easy Ride. We act as an agent for Flex Ride. We are going on, if I can't accommodate a trip, we're going on trying to do our best to build a trip through Flex Ride and, and or any of our volunteer partners. We do everything that we can to, if we can't provide the trip, to find another community partner who can make that trip for you. And over the last 12 months, we've worked with RTD in a travel training experience, helping people identify what that first and last mile is and how to utilize. World does not, world does not stop, continue, it continues to go outside of Broomfield boundaries. So if people need to go downtown for medical appointments or for social visits, whatever it may be, how do they use the RTD transportation? So we've had over 100 participants through the help of RTD but through Easy Ride staff. Again, Easy Ride is just one opportunity and one mode of transportation. So we need to make sure that our residents, our older adults, are aware of and, and have the ability, the competency, and the confidence to use other modes of transportation. Of course, we then we have our Broomfield Local Coordinating Council, and then we work closely with Cultivate, who provides our trips with um, our veterans. One of the things that I really, really want to highlight, guys, here is not only did we look at the study and the results from our stakeholders from the Boomer Bond Assessment, but we also looked at 2018, the CASOA data that was put out by Dr. Cog. We found that 50% of our older adults were not aware of services. So how do you access services and resources if you have no idea what's out there? So I brought Lane Claxton with me, and she's one of, um, to me, I feel like she's the face of Broomfield. We have put over in the, about a year and a half ago, with the help of Lane coordinating this, we have a group of folks that go out. We break out of the brick and mortar. We go out into the community, educate folks. And when you see that increase in ridership and the increase in trips, I, I contribute a lot of this to our community outreach we go to we go out of the community every month we have one designated um, whether it be a, a retirement community or an older adult community we focus on the lower income areas the folks that are walking in our doors they have more access to res, um, resources but how do you how do you identify those who are isolated and how do you get them, how do, you have, how do we educate them about the resources? We take law enforcement, work, um, public health, self-sufficiency, adult protective services, law enforcement, adult protective services, the library, and of course us. We go out and we let the community know what we have to offer. And you'll be amazed, 80% of those who respond to our survey did not know all the services that we had to offer. So that I think is really important, not just for not just for transportation, but for so many other services and opportunities that we have to offer for our older adults. So um, currently right now, I what we want to do moving forward is continue our relationships. So we work with Via Mobility and um, to encourage them. They're right now working with trying to get a partnership and some um, grant opportunity through um, Broomfield Health and Human Services to support, again, keeping those relationships strong. We can't do it alone with just Easy Ride. We need those community partners. So encouraging Via to go after those grants that we have to offer. Continue to work with Cultivate. We're part of the Ride, um, the Ride Alliance. We um, just partnered with Drive Smart Car Fit. We just got a small grant that was offered to us. Super excited about that. Again, making sure that folks understand, not just being told how to access resources. We developed a two-day curriculum where we're gonna give people hands-on experience for the technically savvy, and then what do you do if you don't own a, own a computer? What do you do if you don't know how to access Lyft, Uber, FlexRide, or whatever the other modes of transportation? What happens at five o'clock at night when you get that urinary tract infection or you get that ear infection? What we see, unfortunately, is Monday morning, we get that call from that, that person waiting to go and start those antibiotics because they did not know what other modes of transportation were out there on a Saturday night or a Friday afternoon. We've got to educate our, our community of what those modes of transportation are. So with this grant, I 100% I strongly believe that once we get the pilot running up and running, it'll be a, a sustainable program. We can share it with all, um, not just the older adults, but all adults who need to know how to access um, the um, um, other resources. And again, bottom line, we want older, Broomfield older adults to be able to live and fully participate in their community of choice as long as possible. 
Thank you. Questions? Yes. Microphone. A question about the education uh, outreach. Um, what are the things in Lafayette that we have a, you know, pressure in as we talk about the aging population um, services for um, ambulance and fire? And I'm was wondering if um, working with your first responders and seeing a deep calls that maybe somebody's instead of calling 911 is able to find transportation and there's some center. So one of the things that that's a thank you for asking that we also have what I didn't mention here we have the Broomfield older adult team that we just put together probably three or four months ago and we do have first responders there so we have a group of um, community professionals and partners we do meet on a monthly basis and we talk about some of those challenging cases of how to address those um, right now as far as the transportation after hours I, I there, that still is a barrier unless somebody knows how to maybe um, access a Lyft or an Uber or GoGo grandparents or something like that. But that team does meet on a monthly basis. And again, it does include the um, first responders. We actually have a few success stories of, as far as collaborating, because again, you, when you put everybody in a group and you look at their resources, we found that I have a lot of resources at the senior center, but I don't have as many resources as the EMT or the library or um, health and human services. So what we've, what what we've done is we take challenging cases and so those really tough cases like such as what you mentioned then we'll get together and then kind of collaborate to see what those action steps will be any other questions okay thank you I also wanted to mention that we left you a one sheet of information and the introduction on the Boomer Bond Assessment Tool, and then also a summary of the successes in Broomfield and opportunities and partnerships. So we were only able to really delve into one piece of that, but just wanted to give you a sense of uh, the whole successful aging study. Thank you. So we're going to pick who's going to do next month Community Spotlight, and we pick uh, Boulder County. Right. <laughs> Were you not planning on it, Elise? Oh. <laughs> well, we just closed that for you. So we'll see you next month. And then we will pick uh, Centennial. Our, yep, yeah, for next month. Uh, reports from the chair. I don't have anything to report, so we'll move right on into reports on performance and engagement committee. Uh, Ms. Stolzman? Uh, yeah. I almost forgot. <laughs> Sorry. I was just saying how much I've always wanted to be the community who presented, so that's, that's what was distracting Oh, we me. have you in December. <laughs> Um, thank you, thank you. We did meet. The Performance and Engagement uh, Committee met and we discussed the Executive Director's performance. So I'd like to report back to the group that the Executive Director, uh, Doug Rex, has shown us performance excellence in the last year. Um, it, it really has been um, a true treasure um, to have him uh, work for our agency. Um, the work that, just the day-to-day -day work has been excellent and working and collaborating with us as board members, but we wanted to talk about some of the special programs that have happened in the last year that we really think have been done, that have gone above and beyond. We have a new transportation improvement program. We moved to this building here and saved the organization substantial amounts of money and um, Doug came in on Father's Day to do the move, so that was noticed. Um, he, he's started a program to bring together the city managers so they can collaborate and talk to one another. It's the first time we've ever had that. Really, the Area Agency on Aging has stepped up over time and is really class, it tops now. I mean, it always has been great, but it has really, really improved over time, and we've noticed. Um, Doug has shown excellence in working with other agencies, and it's demonstrated that Dr. Cog is a worthy go-to agency. So we really want to thank Director Rex for his performance over the last year, and it really has been fantastic working with you, Doug. Thanks. Any comments, Doug? 
Well, um, I, I know next year's evaluation is really going to suck after this one. <laughs> that I do know. But uh, no, thank you very much. Obviously, very kind, and I appreciate it. And it's, I know I'm going to state the obvious here, but you know how great a staff we have here. Um, if you don't receive a call back in in uh, in a few hours, there's something wrong. But this this, and our our senior staff too. I really want to point them out. Um, I mentioned this in the P performance and engagement committee. Our new HR director, Randy Arnold, um, when he came on, uh, he's mentioned several times he cannot believe the level of competency and the level of collaboration amongst our senior staff, and it is true. And uh, I'm so appreciative to have um, the great folks that we do here at Dr. Cog, all 20, 125 of them. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Next up, a report from the Finance and Budget Committee, uh, Director Flynn. Thank you. We had a, um, a very good meeting. We discussed and voted to refer to the board next month the 2020 budget. And you all will get a chance to see that in your packets a week beforehand. Please take a look at it. Or you can take a look at the packet in the Finance and Budget agenda for, for this month. Uh, we then uh, we uh, approved a, uh, a motion to structure the AAA voucher program for uh, for senior rides under the uh, voucher program for, we have one vendor right now. Is this working or is this keep cutting That's out? That's working. Sorry, sounds like it's cutting out on me. Uh, right now there's one vendor, but we're gonna bring others on and we've structured the program so that it has a maximum, uh, the, the, the total funding is $125,000, but we're structuring it so that each uh, vendor, each uh, provider, uh, doesn't have an, a maximum amount so that depending on how uh, frequently each provider is used, they won't have to come back to us for more authorization. And as long as everything is under that $125,000. And uh, finally, uh, we approved uh, Doug uh, proceeding with the uh, agreements with the uh, recipients of the HST awards that we approved here at the board level last month. And then for an informational item, we had a very good presentation from Ashley Summers on the Regional Data Acquisition Program, and uh, please read the, uh, the Finance and Budget Agenda if you want to get caught up on that. Uh, but it's going to uh, do some, uh, more, some more imageries, including uh, elevation, which uh, I was surprised to learn can change, uh, at a, and this will measure it at a micro level so that even little neighborhood projects, like there was a drainage project in my neighborhood uh, last year, so this will capture the new uh, elevations that will guide uh, decisions about flow of storm water and, and, and things like that. So it was, it, d despite that description, it was actually very interesting. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you're turned on by the flow of storm water. <laughs> Thank you very much, Director Flynn. Uh, I do. <laughs> uh, before we move on, I do want to thank uh, Director Stolzman for hosting the meeting because the chair and the vice chair were away. So thank you very much for taking care of us. Honor, yeah. uh, honor yeah. wedding anniversary and and John owes you. So I was stuck for twelve hours. <laughs> All right, so moving right along, uh, reports from the executive director, uh, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, we will be having a November 6th board work session. Um, we're going to have a couple topics at least. One is uh, uh, related to um, Metro Vision 2040 uh, implementation, dare I say, Mile High Compact 2.0. So it's basically it's a readout of, the, of our workshop that we held back in August and then talk about next steps and how we want to proceed with that. We also, we're going to have a AAA item. Um, I, I won't get into the details here now because it'll take me some time to explain it, but basically there, we've been alert to something that might have a, have a um, well, a dramatic effect on our service providers as far as their ability to provide service. Um, and um, so we're gonna, we're gonna have a conversation. We have a potential solution, but we wanted to share that with you. So I'll let that just hang in the air um, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to attend the November 6th meeting. Um, so we, uh, we're already planning for the 2020 Dr. Cog Award celebration. It's uh, gonna be held in, on April 22nd at Empower Field at Mile High. How about that for a change pace? Yeah, so uh, we're, we're pretty excited about it, and I think everybody always likes going to the ballpark, and there'll be nothing but winners there that evening. 
Right? right? I'm a Kansas City Chiefs fan, by the way. So I throw that out there, too. <laughs> um, no, so we already have a theme. It's a... Uh, it's 2020 vision, and we'll be looking back at our first Metro plan, which was adopted back in the late 1990s. And of course, looking forward to um, uh, all the great projects and people that make this such a great place to work uh, here in the present and into the future. So we're really excited about that. So please, uh, please mark that on your calendars. Um, last, Wednesday and 30, uh, last Wednesday and Thursday, Dr. Cog provided meeting space for a dozen local governments and regional partners uh, to learn more about regional approaches to greenhouse gas emissions, tracking and reporting on, and uh, climate action planning. Um, through a successful application submitted by the City County of Denver and the City of Boulder, our region was one of four regions that was selected um, to receive technical assistance to create successful case studies of, re of regions in the U.S. working together to promote and support voluntary actions to address climate change. So I was there for the first little bit. I, I, it, was, it was very interesting, man. There was some technical stuff, boy. There's a lot of smart people that were in that room, and I wasn't one of them. But it was, it was very good. Um, we are, we are currently working with the project team to find a, uh, find, find a time to, to give the board a briefing on, on, on this initiative. Um, so we're kind of shooting for December, so stay tuned on that. City County Managers Forum that was mentioned earlier. Um, we do have a, uh, our next scheduled meeting is Thursday, November 14th. We have a great attendance at those meetings. So if you see your city managers in the hall, please point out uh, that we'd love to have him or her present for that. It's, it's fabulous. The topics this month are uh, homelessness and, um, and op uh, opioid ad addiction. So, and those, those topics were at the request of the city county managers. Doug? Yes, I sir. <clears throat> will you send an email out to us with that information so we can pass it on to our city managers? No, most definitely will. Yeah. Oh, you, you, you're nodding? Okay, we will. Yes, we'll definitely do that. Um, Medicare open enrollment. So at your tables, ta tables you'll, you'll see a flyer related to Medicare open enrollment, um, which uh, began yesterday and runs through December 7th. Um, just so you all know, Dr. Cog is a designated, what they, what they refer to as SHIP, or the, a State Health Insurance Assistance Program. And our region covers three counties, Jefferson, Arapahoe, and Douglas counties. And what we provide is free counseling to help make certain, certain folks, um, make sure that they're, make certain that folks are getting the, the, um, the right information about the correct plan that they should choose. Um, there's a lot of information out there now, a lot of private sector uh, stuff that you're seeing out there, insurance companies and the like, and obviously they want them to choose their plan, but um, what we provide is that objective information to, to, our, to our seniors. So, um, so, so please, if you know anybody that needs assistance, to call us. And of course, we will, we will answer the phones if, the, if we get calls from counties outside of those three, but, um, we, but please do, yes, yeah, share, share our information with them. <clears throat> Citizens Academy. Um, we're currently in the middle of our Fall Citizens Academy, um, and, and of course, again, that's a program that helps build the civic capacity of Denver uh, region's residents. I want to give a special shout out to Chairman Bob Pfeiffer and staff at Arvada that hosted over 40 or so of our academy participants on October 8th to learn uh, um, uh, more about the three decades of initiatives to create Old Town Arvada. Um, and uh, I, by all accounts, it went really well, Bob. So thank you very much. We really appreciate you guys hosting. It was fun. It was great, actually. <laughs> good, they good. showed up on the G line. We walked through the old town, and they departed on the G line. So it was it was all a transit evening in our history. <laughs> um, so in August, you may recall, we announced funding through the Rose Community Foundation, funding to advance age-friendly strategies being pursued by local governments in our region. Um, so I'm pleased to announce tonight that um, City County of Broomfield, uh, City of Castle Pines, Centennial, Edgewater, each receive fund funding to advance their age-friendly fr efforts through this opportunity. Uh, Dr. Cog, talk, Dr. Cog and Rose Community Foundation staff are working with each of those communities to finalize the project details and contracts. So congratulations to you all. Uh, 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 oh. So, anybody interested in serving on the executive committee? 
<laughs> All hands go up. No. So Connie will be, she'll be sending out a uh, expression of interest form by the end of the uh, end of October. So if you are indeed interested, please fill that out and get that back to Connie in a, I'll say a timely fashion. I, I, I'm sure that the deadlines will be included in that, that correspondence. Um, and I, before I, before we leave, I just wanted to also echo the comments that uh, Chairman Pfeiffer made with regards to our outgoing um, members, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rick Teeter, um, Mayor Ron Rakowski, and of course, uh, Mayor Daniel Dick. And I will, Mayor Daniel Dick did send us an email earlier, and I just wanted to read you a couple sentences from this. Um, in part, he said, I have been embraced and included by this wonderful organization by such skilled and knowledgeable people. They are providing the highest level of service possible. Thank you. I am grateful and love each and every one of you. I will miss you very much. Life is a wonderful adventure. Daniel Dick, Mayor of Federal Heights. So I thought that was awfully good. Um, and I also had an opportunity and the honor to um, to speak at Mayor Ron Rakowski's, and I'm looking for it here in my word, at Mayor Ron Rakowski's um, end of term celebration this, this past Monday. And we had, how many of you think were there, Ron? Probably 200? So yeah, I was I was a little blown away. I wasn't expecting that kind of crowd. It was pretty impressive. Not that it, you shouldn't have gotten that crowd. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> and if I could find it here real quick, I just wanted to share. Oh, here it is. I just wanted to share a couple of comments that I that I mentioned at at that at that meeting because Ron is obviously very special to us all, and we appreciate him being here this evening. Um, well, I won't get into the first stuff I said early on. Ron knows what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, I thought it was a roast, not not a not a celebration. <laughs> what is this celebration tribute? I thought it was a roast. Anyway, so um, so I, I I said there were many many obviously traits that of Ron Murkowski that I really appreciate, but the one I'm most acute to is is um, is his ability to listen. Um, and many years ago, my father told me try to listen at least as much as you speak. And you know, in in his mind, you know, that was a quality trait of a leader, right? And while I have been I haven't been able to really heed that advice, Ron is a master at it. And anybody who's been around this table for any length of time, normally he sits right in that space right there. He always lets the debate happen, right? The discussion happens. He's always fairly quiet about my, uh, during that during during that discussion. And then all of a sudden, you'll see this, and that was he was ready to speak. And in a lot of cases, you know, he was the arbiter of that, that conversation, that discussion, and uh, he was always had the knack of summarizing the debate, and most times, and hopefully most times, we, we found some resolution. So, Ron, thank you very much. And I did say on behalf of Dr. Cog, 58 local governments, our board of directors and staff, I wanted to thank him for his 12 plus years of service on the Dr. Cog board. Um, and I also wanted to thank him for having the foresight and understanding that in order for this region to be who we say we wanna be when we grow up, that it takes a regional collaboration and an understanding of our differences. I guess what I was trying to say that while it, it truly does take a village, what it took in our case was a village manager. Or sorry, a very village mayor. So, uh, so thank you, sir, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, to be to participate in that lovely event. And it was. Executive Director, can I make a yes, sir? You may. Additional remark. One thing I staff is really staff always has. To Celebrate, honey. Oh, amen to that. <laughs> you preach, brother. That's definitely the case. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm I'm complete. Thank you very much. All right, moving right along on item number eight, public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from, uh, from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there are no public comments on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. I see I have 
someone up to speak. My name is Randall Loeb. I'm a citizen advocate in Denver. Have been on the streets for most of my time here. Very happy to hear the managers dealing with homelessness. It's a great thing for you to do. Uh, I don't think we do it collectively well enough. Uh, you mentioned environmental issues. I think that's what I um, spread around in various places. There's a forum on that, on, on the perspective of people living in poverty who are from different minorities regarding their rights of protecting the earth uh, and making it a possibility for us to keep this in perpetuity for our children. Uh, I'm a, an old man now. I'm not as old as some of you and not as um, young as some of you. But uh, I was very interested in the Broomfield presentation uh, because you mentioned people who don't have computers. Uh, I am also interested in us being more sensitive, and I was on the Citizen Academy, uh, to people who are indigent, who don't have access to whatever it is in order to get anywhere, and in languish in severe poverty and isolation. And as these elements begin to come and we change in terms of winter, um, the quality of life of people in, who are living marginally is exacerbated even further. There's a um, little piece of paper that's basically resources. I used to work for a newspaper for homeless people where I was the manager of it, and we put out information basically in about half the paper on where you could go. There isn't really any comprehensive way, and we always talk about the county line and whether or not you can receive services as an aging person in Arapaho, um, whatever, Jefferson, and whatever else it was. Um, and I think it's understandable that we don't simply stay in one place. So I did a presentation last week at the Housing Colorado Conference in Keystone. It's my va annual vacation. And there's an annual review put out by the Brown School of Washington University in St. Louis on an annual basis that I refer to. It's called the Solving Homelessness from a Complex Systems Perspective, Insight for Prevention Responses. I really recommend that you become um, well-versed in what we can do together across all these boards, including this in terms of our environment to make it possible for us to thrive. As I was saying to two people in the back, uh, the, the congestion on the roadways in, and my, there's my steed back there, um, of, uh, in Holland is for too many bike riders. God knows I wish we had that blessing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else want to address the board? Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. I'm, I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda, which is the minutes of the September 18th meeting, attachment A. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? That carries. Moving on to item number 10 on the action item list, discussion of amendments to the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program, attachment B in your packet, uh, Mr. Cottrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this evening we have four amendments for your consideration to the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program. Uh, the first is a new project um, to add $20,430,000 in State Transportation Commission contingency funds for emergency repairs on US 36 uh, to repair what happened this um, last uh, July in the eastbound lanes uh, near Westminster. Uh, this project is a little unique in terms of the TIP. Um, in typical circumstances, we put in projects into the TIP before they happen. But in the, chance, in the uh, circumstances with emergency projects, um, we typically work with our federal partners and that is the reverse, where projects typically uh, will go into the TIP after the fact. So again, this, is, this project, this new project is in reaction to those repairs that took place. The second project is the Region 1 Faster Pool. Um, this project adds seven new pool projects using the available funding. The third is the 30th in Colorado Bike and Pet Underpass, um, sponsored by the City of Boulder. Um, this project actually adds $8 million in local overmatch and um, able to uh, advertise the project. 
Um, the additional overmatch is required due to an, uh, an alternative preferred layout in the design versus what was originally proposed. So to make this happen, we needed to move the years, uh, the, move the funding to FY20 and move it from the previous 2018 TIP. The fourth uh, and final amendment for your consideration is to add $8 million in federal freight funding to add a southbound truck climbing lane and $50,000 in local funds for various wildlife improvements to the I-25 capacity improvements project from Castle Rock to the El Paso County line, otherwise known as the GAP project. Um, so that, that concludes the four projects that are before you. Um, and happy to take any questions or comments that you may have. Do we have any questions or comments? Yes, Director Teal. In Castle Rock, we did have questions pertaining to how, how do uh, projects get added to the faster pool? Um, it, can you brief us in on that? I mean, what qualifies a project to be added in there? And then give us an idea on the process to get added. I'll actually turn that maybe over to someone with CDOT that has a little bit more uh, education on that. Director White. <laughs> if I can get this to work. Um, why don't I ask Danny Herman to come up, who does this every day for a living. I'm Danny Herman with CDOT Region 1. I'm the planning program manager. And faster safety, um, it's, we recently, so by legislation, it just has to be a safety project. But CDOT, a couple of years ago, went through and did an audit and put some requirements on with um, benefit cost ratios, things like that. So it's determined by the various traffic units in the state. They have a state uh, statewide allocation formula based on accident history and things like that, how it gets divvied up. And then each region's traffic unit allocates those funds. We do take input from the locals. If you submit applications for our HSIP hazard elimination program, those are also eligible and considered for faster safety. Any other questions? Yes, Director Jones. I just wanted to put in a plug for the US 36 emergency funding. Um, obviously, we were a bit chagrined to see our roadway fall apart. Uh, but really, hats off to CDOT for putting it back together so quickly. We really appreciate that, the, the fast work and the communications. And uh, look forward to figuring out um, how to prevent that from ever happening to a roadway again. And hopefully, um, CDOT can help us figure that out. But I uh, just wanted to, to give a shout out to CDOT and uh, thank them for um, putting our road back together. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Looking for a motion? I move. I have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? That carries. Next up is item 11 on your agenda, the discussion of recommendations of projects to be funded through the Community Mobility Planning and Implementation, also known as CMPI, set-asides of the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program, attachment C in your packet. Uh, Mr. Webb uh, is up. Oh, Lindsay's doing it. My name is Emily Lindsay. Oh. I'm with the Transportation Planning and Operations Division, and I'm here with my colleague, Derek Webb, who's in the Regional Planning and Development Division. So we worked on this together, which is why you get both of us this evening. Um, so we are here to talk about the Community Mobility Planning and Implementation Set-Aside. So these, this is a two-year funding opportunity for fiscal years 2020 and 2021. So I'm sure you all know we have a variety of set-aside programs in the Transportation Improvement Program. This is just one of those five different set-asides. So you'll be hearing th about these different set-asides um, if you haven't already uh, at up upcoming meetings. But we are here to talk about that first one, the CMPI set-aside. So the goal of the set-aside is to support planning and small infrastructure projects um, that contribute to the implementation of key outcomes outlined in MetroVision and the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. So I think you'll kind of notice those two key elements of planning and small infrastructure. So really better connecting our planning decisions and our infrastructure investments um, with the, the very specific goals to support livable communities, um, the development of connected urban centers and multimodal corridors, a transportation system that's well connected and serves all modes of travel, um, supporting healthy and active choices, and expanding access and opportunities 
for residents of all ages, incomes, and abilities. Okay. And so like I kind of outlined, there are two different aspects to this set aside, and you'll see that in the recommendation. Um, we have around $2.3 million, and uh, that's divided into planning projects and small infrastructure projects. Uh, the local cash match required is, is pretty typical for our set-asides. It's 17.21% of the total project cost. Um, and with this particular set-aside, we did not have a specific maximum or minimum defined. We really wanted folks to work together to come up with creative ideas. So I'm going to hand it over to Derek, and he's going to give you an overview of the process and an idea of the recommended projects. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, so, uh, thank you, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, you may remember uh, in May, uh, we had the uh, eligibility criteria and selection uh, process document in front of you uh, for approval. Um, right after that meeting, uh, we um, released the call for projects for the uh, letters of intent. So um, you may remember this was a two-step uh, process. First time we were trying this, where we were really interested in having uh, upfront um, kind of informal conversations with uh, local government staff uh, throughout the region to, to see, hear their ideas, see what they were thinking, uh, see what might be a good fit for this uh, set aside. Um, during that time between May and, and pretty much the, it was, you know, the, the second, third week of May um, through the end of May, we received 44 letters of, um, of intent. Um, and I believe the breakdown was 18 communities throughout the region. Um, we spent the entire month of June uh, really reviewing and discussing um, each of those letters of intent with each um, uh, local government sponsor. Um, really that discussion focused on eligibility, um, competitiveness, uh, that type of thing, just to make sure that everything um, really fit in with the, uh, the, the intent of the set aside. Um, at that point, um, everybody was invited to uh, put in a full application. We didn't turn anybody away. Um, all of the projects were deemed uh, eligible and, and worthy of, of, um, of the, the set aside. Um, we, s at the end, uh, let's see, uh, the end of July, the um, applications were due. And at that time, we received 32 applications, uh, which were roughly uh, split between uh, 14 planning and 18 small infrastructure. Uh, you can see the full list of those applications in, um, I believe, the, the, the end of, of this item. Um, we spent, as staff, um, we spent the entire uh, month of August and then uh, the initial part of September reviewing. Um, and I believe the next slide, yep, gets into the application review process. So um, it was an internal project review panel, uh, which was made up of the executive office, the regional planning and development division, and the transportation and planning uh, and operations divisions. Um, we, uh, each one of us reviewed those applications individually and came up with our, our own rank and, and scored each of those projects. And then we got together um, uh, toward the end of August and then once again in, in September to really discuss and rank those projects and, and come up with a priority uh, level. Um, the evaluation criteria you can see on the screen, not too well. Um, sorry about that. Uh, it was really based around uh, project type, partnerships and collaboration, innovation and transferability, uh, the alignment with those CMP, CMPI set aside goals that Emily just walked you through, and then uh, alignment with MetroVision in general. Um, at the end of that, uh, we have a set of funding for both planning and both uh, and for small infrastructure. Uh, this is just the rundown of the planning projects that were selected. We did have a smaller amount uh, for planning projects, but you'll notice down there at the bottom we had uh, 50, a little over $51,000 remaining um, just based on the breakdown of, of how uh, projects were scored. Uh, we did uh, reach out to the next project on the list. Um, that project was, it was indicated in their application that it wasn't scalable, but we still wanted to reach out and see if there was any way they were still interested in making up the funds needed uh, to complete that project. Um, they did decline uh, just based on the scale of that project. And so we did decide since there will be another um, call for projects in year and a half, two years uh, for the second cycle of, of these funds to just roll those funds into that, um, into that balance. Um, here are the small infrastructure projects. Uh, again, we had a little bit more money in this pot, so a few more um, projects we were able to fund or recommend for funding. Uh, you will notice that all, um, all of the funds were um, allocated in this portion of the set aside. Um, with the exception of uh, the last one, the City of Thornton Trailway Finding Signage, uh, you may note the, the little asterisk, it, it denotes partial funding. Um, we did, that was pretty much as, uh, going rank top to bottom. Um, that was what we had left at the end um, based on rank. And so um, that 
project specifically was indicated that it was scalable, so we reached out, talked to the City of Thornton staff, um, and they did uh, decide to go for it and um, w did ultimately submit a revised scope for their application indicating the, the change in um, project uh, scope um, to, to address the, the slight decrease in funds. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, Emily and I can stand for any questions you may have, but there's a proposed motion for you. Any questions? Any comments? Seeing none, I'll look for a motion. I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Abstention, sorry, opposed? Abstentions? Seeing none, that motion carries. Moving on to item 12 in your packet. Uh, discussion of second year TIP project delays. It's attachment D, Mr. Cottrell. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. So the adopted 2016-2021 TIP policy, which governs the FY19 projects, project delays, uh, states that project phases are delayed for, project phases that are delayed for a second year are allowed to appeal to the board for a variance to continue if that phase is still uh, still delayed and therefore not initiated after October 15th. So Dr. Cog's staff has taken the time to review all the, the statuses of all the project phases that received a first year delay last year in 2018. So and after confirming with our, our planning partners, uh, it's been, de been determined that two projects continue to be delayed um, and not initiated by October 15th. Uh, so those two projects receiving a second year delay include uh, the Broadway Station and I-25 Safety and Access Improvements Project, sponsored by the City and County of Denver. This project modifies Broadway, Exposition, Lincoln, the southbound on-ramp, and the approaches to the Broadway Station all within the vicinity of I-25. The project phase that is delayed is uh, for a second year is construction, meaning the project would have needed to be advertised to no longer be delayed. The second project uh, delayed is the multi-use path on the D10, uh, sponsored by the City of Lakewood. Uh, so this project constructs two element, two segments on the D10 bike path. Um, this project phase, and the phases that are also delayed is construction, very similar to the Broadway project, meaning the project uh, would have needed to be advertised uh, for construction to no longer be delayed. Um, if you look at attachments two and three, um, there are letters by each of the project sponsors um, outlining that they wish to appeal to the board and con to continue their projects. So at this time, as outlined in the adapted policy, the board has two options to consider. The first would be to deny the appeal, and any amount, any amount of federal funds not spent would be returned to Dr. Cog for eventual reprogramming. The second option would be to allow a variance of up to 120 days from October 1st, um, and that pushes, the, pushes that deadline out to January 29th. If that deadline is not met at that time, all the federal funds for the delayed phase would need to be returned to Dr. Cog for eventual reprogramming. The staff recommendation is to approve 120 day variance for both of these projects to allow them to continue. And at this time, if the chair would allow, is to give each of the project sponsors the opportunity to either um, comment on their appeal or be available to answer any, answer any questions from board members. I'll entertain that. Denver, do you wanna go first? Um, yeah. Dr. Williams. I'd invite uh, Deb Turner up to give a brief overview. Good evening, thanks for having me. Deb Turner, Denver Public Works. I'm an engineering supervisor. Um, so we're here tonight to ask you to approve our request for a variance to grant the 120 day extension on the construction bids. Um, we believe we were on track to meet this deadline. We'd had approved, um, our design was complete, our utility clearance was complete, our right of way clearances were complete. We had a 2008 environmental assessment that we were doing a reeval on. SHPO, had, all the clearances were done on that, and SHPO had approved it. But one of the um, the West Washington Park Neighborhood Association, who was a consultant to the, the EA, um, had opportunity to look at it and disagreed with SHPO's um, approval. So. Um, we have met with the West Washington Park Neighborhood Association three times. 
they were, their main concern was about the cross section for Exposition Avenue. And in this area, we did not need any right of way. We, they have a zero foot setback on Exposition, so we have quite a wide right of way in that area. Um, so we, we worked with the community to narrow up the cross section another three to four feet to address their concerns, and we're working with CDOT and FHWA, and we believe we will make that 120-day deadline. Um, any questions? Any questions from any of the directors? Seeing none, uh, let's let's vote on these individually so we make sure. So why don't we look for a motion for Denver's uh, request for a second year extension of under Moved. Director Williams. Do we have a second? All in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Abstentions? That carries. You have your extension for 120 days. Thank you very much. Next up, Lakewood. Richard Gutman. Uh, Wine. Thank you. And we have Mike Whitaker from the City of Lakewood. Hi, Mike Whitaker, City Transportation Engineer at Lakewood. Um, talking about the Lakewood D10 multi use path. Um, going into it, obviously, there's a lot of right away right next to the RTD line. It looked like an easy fix. Little did we know. Um, <laughs> how much building a path was so hard. Um, RTD has actually been the easy partner on this project. Um, we've had the, the land swap agreement ready for them for over a year. Um, so we're going to go to council uh, soon with that on December 9th will be the second reading. Um, most, of the, most of the effort's been with the property owners adjacent. Um, it's been a highly controversial project. Uh, we actually had four property owners move um, when they found out there was going to be a path back there. So that shows you the level of consternation some of the area residents had. Uh, so we spent a lot of effort working on right-of-way acquisitions. We only need a couple of feet plus construction easements. Um, we're through everybody but one parcel owner um, and he actually doesn't really change the design of the path. So um, everybody who who's uh, adjacent to the path that we need for the, the project um, has agreed. All the properties haven't closed yet, but we're in the process with the title companies of closing them. Uh, the other portion that's been really uh, hard is we have the White Lateral Ditch Company and the Lakewood Heights uh, Water Company. And those of you that work with ditch companies know they've they've thrown a lot of stuff into us. Um, it's uh, kind of a holdover from RTD when they built the W line. They really want a pound of flesh from RTD and uh, we get to be the ones trying to satisfy that. Um, so the attorneys for both sides have the agreements in place. There's been a couple of small design deviations that they want changed and it looks like we're gonna be good um, to, we're targeting November 14th for the signatures on the, the ditch companies. Um, that gets us to plans to CDOT about November 15th, go through their review process, the federal review process. So we believe we can meet the, the 120 day extension in uh, January. 29th for uh, advertising. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Seeing none, I'll look for a motion to support their 120 day extension. Got a first and a second. All in favor say aye. aye. Oh, sorry. Those opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Yes, Director Zabo. Yes. I, so what happens if they don't make their 120 days? They, I think the funds come back they to us. They go back. Or go back to And then the that pot. project just stays halfway, or what, what happens? If the funds to make are, sense. Yeah, if the funds are no longer available to any of the sponsors for reprogramming, the assumption is that they continue the project just without the federal funds. I mean, that's the hope, but they would not be allowed to ask CDOT for reimbursement. Ah, okay. All righty, moving right along on informational briefings, it's item number 13, CDOT State Highway and Transportation Funding Allocation Discussion. I believe we have Executive Director Lou that's going to be joining us up. Why don't you come on up with uh, Director White? 
Come on down, you're the next contestant here at Dr. Cog. <laughs> We're not voting to, for your items, so that's probably, we got information this time, so. Seems like the controls are here. <laughs> All right, uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for taking a few minutes to talk to us about uh, wh wh where we are with our transportation planning process uh, that we've worked together with many, many people in this room to um, proceed with over the, sorry, does this thing come out? Uh, over, over the course, this, it's working. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, which we've really worked on together since May and over the course of the summer. You know, as I think most of you probably know, you know, since uh, since May and through the course of the month since, you know, we've worked to update our um, ten-year statewide planning effort, um, including a, an immediate exercise to dedicate the 267 funds that are currently available but also sort of leading into a longer term conversation about the sort of a aspirational project list that we're continuing to work on. Um, you know, ju just a quick recap of you know, what we did. You know, the purpose of this process was really to provide all areas of the state equal opportunity to provide input into the planning process. Um, so with that, you know, we combined the 64 county meetings that we do periodically uh, by, by kind of having all of those take place over the course of a short period of time. You know, we met with municipalities, we met with community groups. You know, we, we tried to really get a balance of um, meeting people where they were at um, in terms of talking about you know, the need for transportation and trying to kind of bring it close to home in terms of the kind of impact of transportation dollars. You know, bringing all of the modes together into a single statewide conversation you know, was a big part of this and you know, really in the metro area, you know, especially it's you know, become a conversation about how to make sure that we're you know, investing in projects with co-benefits to the maximum extent possible and working very closely with the projects that all of you are investing in. And know, knowing that there, you know, we aren't going to build our way out of congestion and we have to be sort of thinking in a nimble way about how to sort of look at the options that we need to prepare for the future. You know, giving small projects equal consideration to large ones you know, was one of, I, I think, the key takeaways from this process. You know, because we sometimes deal in such big numbers at the state level, you know, we have a tendency to not talk as much about the tremendous impact of a small project of, you know, tens of millions, single millions, you know, even sometimes in the thousands can have on a community. And, you know, something that we heard loud and clear from many, many of the citizens that we talked to is that they're often, you know, as, as focused on the traffic light in front of their house as on the mega project. And, you know, for normal people, that makes sense, right? You know, we, we all interact with transportation at a, you know, very granular level. And I think for us, this was sort of a reminder to take seriously, you know, the things that matter in people's daily lives. You know, identifying what we want from our transportation system. You know, part of this was also about turning the discussion from one that's about, you know, how do we build it to what are we using it for? And, you know, having it be a conversation about getting people from, you know, home to school, to the grocery store, to their job, you know, to recreation, et cetera, et cetera. And really focusing in on a people conversation about where, you know, people and stuff need to go with our transportation system. You know, the goal is a 10-year strategic pipeline of projects, you know, inclusive of all modes and really informed by a data-driven assessment that, you know, for those of you who participated in our conversations know is very focused on geospatial analysis. We uh, really head at it with maps. It was kind of fun doing the roadshow with Dr. Cog because we each had, you know, our, our, our packet of maps and I think we had probably like, you know, pr proven ESRI's value in the world by the time we were done at those meetings. As I was saying, um, you know, th this just gives you a little bit of a sense of where, you know, where, where we had the meetings and what kinds of meetings they are. You know, you can see that a lot of them uh, were local elected, elected official and community leader meetings. These include the 64 county meetings, but also the discussions that we had at the municipal levels and otherwise. Mm -hmm. Um, the TPRs, you know, we're going through a process which that's continuing where, you know, we've really gone through several iterations with each of the TPRs to kind of cross-check the data that we're getting against the gr groups of subject matter experts. 
um, stakeholder meetings in kind of places where we tried to be creative. You know, we did, did, did a lot of hanging out in front of grocery stores with uh, surveys trying to get people to talk to us about transportation. My, my personal favorite was that we set up shop at the DMV because everybody who was sitting there, you know, we know that they were thinking about transportation and gave them information on how to participate <laughs> in our process. <laughs> <laughs> captive, captive audience at least once every so often. <laughs> and then community events, you know, trying to go to county fairs and, you know, other farmers markets and such. This just gives you, you know, some of the kind of key stats on the impact. You know, one, one piece that I think is really interesting is we set up an online map that allowed, you know, I mentioned that we were a bit obsessed with maps, um, allowed people to go and put a pin in where they were experiencing some frustration or had some hope for their transportation system, and you know, 17,305 people took us up on it. And, you know, I think that that you know, it was very concrete, you know, not practical, down to earth, and that one, you know, I think really resonated with a lot of people. Um, but you know, you, you you could see that we tried to get feedback in a lot of very different ways, really trying hard to get at different audiences, ranging. You know, from the experts who we all work with to, you know, everyday people, whether their concern is about a big project or the pothole in front of their house. You know, thousands of people weighed in, um, and there, there were sort of three common themes that we heard about you know, really everywhere we went. And, you know, one of the things that for me was, I think, mo most and least surprising about this process was sort of how different the conversations were, but how similar some of the themes that resonated um, came to be. You know, road condition and sort of key basic safety issues came up everywhere. Um, and, you know, I think we actually appreciated the level of consideration for the fact that maintaining state of good repair is on people's radar is something important. You know, we, we know it needs to happen, but it's never going to be the kind of glitziest project in the, you know, portfolio. And the fact that we just heard so many people tell us over and over and over again, just take care of the roads. You know, I think it gives us a sort of top cover to, you know, focus hard on asset management you know, in places where we need to. You know, growth and congestion impacting the quality of life um, came up constantly and unsurprisingly, you know, e even more so in the conversations along the Front Range. But, you know, w when we had discussions along the Mountain Carter, you know, it's a different version of the same. So, you know, de depending on what day of the week it is, the conversation came up in different parts of the state. Um, lack of travel options, you know, a tremendously resonant theme. You know, again, er everything from, you know, not, not enough modal options you know, in places like the Denver Metro to not enough redundancy of routes, um, particularly in some of the more rural areas. This just gives you a little bit of a snapshot of the themes that we heard um, by kind of ge geographic distribution. You know, again, uh, a, a lot of uh, orange safety circles, um, you know, the growth and congestion sort of sh showing up vaguely along the 25 and 70 routes, as you would expect. Um, you know, freight being an issue that came up a lot, but particularly in the conversations along the Eastern Plains. Um, and lack of travel options, again, you know, a, a kind of you know, consistency on the front range, but not, you know, com coming up elsewhere and meaning slightly different things in slightly different places. Um, th this, this we wanted to point to because while we were going through this process, um, we got a very bad grade from an external report from the Reason Foundation, and we thought it was interesting because, you know, the areas where we sort of got dinged as falling towards the back of the list, you know, fit almost exactly with what we were hearing from people over the course of our conversations. Um, you know, I think the be, being number forty-seven on, you know, rural interstate pavement condition, you know, we. We, we were not happy to see it in a national report, but nor were we surprised because it had just come up so many times and time again in conversations uh, about you know, the condition of some of our rural roads and you know being told that there were places that a lot of people use for you know, tourism beyond the communities that live there and that they haven't been touched in decades. You know, also not surprising that urbanized area congestion um, is creeping towards the bottom of the list. You know, again, resonating with themes we heard. Um, and that urban arterial pavement condition, we're not doing too well. Um, and that, you know, I mean, in, in our conversations with many of you and you know, previewing what we'll talk about in a minute, um, you know, th that, that's something we have been hearing about increasingly. And, you know, unfortunately, corresponding to seeing statistics showing that there's real safety issues 
you know, on the place, places like Federal and Colfax in Colorado, which are the, you know, state, state roads that go through cities and sort of, you know, function both as state highways and corridors that you know, are thoroughfares for pedestrians, bikes, etc. Um, ju just a kind of quick snapshot of some of the things that we're trying to bring together in this plan. You know, part of the goal was instead of you know, going to the same citizens however many times as there are boxes on the slide with different conversations, you try and you know, talk to people once and you know, within, within the halls of CDOT furnish the different reports that we need to populate. Um, so this just kind of gives you a sense of what we are trying to streamline through this conversation. Um, and all right. So that now, now, now to the kind of more concrete and tangible part for you know, what, what we are doing in this stage of the discussion and why we wanted to talk to you tonight. You know, the, I, I mentioned earlier that the first step of this process for us is to allocate the funds that we have. Um, you know, because of um, Senate Bill 267, we're scheduled to receive up to $1.65 billion over the next three years. You know, combined with the SB1, um, SB262, um, and other funds. You know, this includes both the highway dollars and the multimodal funds for transit and otherwise. Um, and that we use this process to help us focus how to you know, get the most bang for our buck from these dollars. You know, part of what we see is the value of having this process followed by the allocation of these dollars is that it gives us a way to tell the story of how we took an additional you know, charge of funding that is not enough to solve all of our problems, but really putting it to work to show that you know, when we invest more in the system, it makes a difference. So the, that, that brings us to the exercise that we're working through with the Transportation Commission. And uh, th this, this week, uh, with the SAC, and again with the Transportation Commission next month and into December, really with an eye towards allocating uh, these current dollars and putting them to work. You know, the guidance that we got from the Transportation Commission last month, uh, you know, following on a conversation about how to sort of find an equitable breakdown across the state and between urban and rural, but also between interstates and the smaller routes, many of which haven't been touched in a long time, was that the kind of basic breakdown that we we're striving for is to take the, th there was a 25% set aside for rural funds in 267, and to interpret that to mean, you know, don't, don't use all of the funds on Floyd Hill and call it rural. Um, I mean, e even, even though it has a rural component, but really to focus that allocation on those smaller routes that you know, have, have not gotten the treatment over the course of years and to sort of lump the larger projects, including the kind of big rural interstate projects, you know, the Floyd Hill being the non-random example, um, and, and the urban projects into a um, mix comprising the other 75%. You know, our, our goal has been to try and make sure that of the investment dollars, about half of them include significant elements of asset management, you know, build, building on that theme that we heard of needing to take care of the basics. And kind of recognizing that all of our sort of more future-looking aspirations don't work unless we have a strong foundation. And, you know, I think as, as we learned from examples, including our recent work on US 36, if the foundation is shaky, you know, n nothing on top of it is going to be strong. So this is a, a, a map kind of statewide of where the pr projects that we have proposed to commission are. Um, you know, this is obviously a bit, a bit of a geospatial eye chart and hard to see the specifics of where it is, but the, you know, the, the sense we wanted to give you is that this 25% that are the rural paving projects, you know, we try, we use the CDOT planning regions to make sure that those are distributed you know, across the rural parts of Colorado. Um, region one, which is the region where mo most most of the folks in this room are situated, uh, does not is not um, allocating funds towards the rural paving program because of where it is. Um, but each of the other uh, CDOT regions has a sort of rural program, which are represented in these green lines. Um, the major capital projects, you can see, and you can kind of see the urban rural breakdown here. Um, so to cut to the chase on what is probably of greatest interest to the folks in this room, we wanted to take an opportunity to walk through um, what we are proposing to commission is the breakdown for funds for Region 1, which is most of the Denver um, metro area. You know, a couple of caveats that I would offer to this. Um, one, you know, th there's the 119 
project are in region four, not region one. The rest of this is region one. Um, you know, the, the other is, that, does, it, does this one have the total project cost? Um, so something we can follow up with if folks are interested is that for some of these projects, particularly the big ones, we know that this is not the full project cost. And the idea was you know, to, in a world of limited resources, put you know, enough that we kind of kickstart the project to a point where we can talk about financing options and otherwise to make it happen. So you know, to just walk through this quickly, you know, the I-25 South Gap project is the project that's underway already. Um, there is a piece of the funding that was missing and this makes that project whole. You know, I-270 I widening, you know, we know that this one has been uh, of critical need and a big focus for many of you for a long time. And, and by putting 200 million into it through this source of funds, you know, we, 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 it's not gonna be the whole project cost, but the idea is to then be able to finance the rest of it through a combination of you know, man managed lands and other sources and you know, be, able, be able to make that project happen. Um, I-25 uh, component, what that, what that is is the funds needed to procure the right-of-way um, for Burnham Yard and to do the initial planning stage. So it is not the project cost, which we don't know the project cost for that one yet because it is early on, but th th this is enough to secure Burnham Yard, we think, um, and, you know, ass assuming that the details of that pan out, um, and, and to go through the planning phase to sort of turn it into a project. Um, Floyd Hill. You know, an, another one where we know it's a must have and has been for a long time. We also know that $100 million is not enough to complete the project, which is probably upwards of half a billion dollars. You know, what we are looking at here potentially is to put additional funds uh, through the Bridge Enterprise Program from CDOT into the project and then to you know, look at financing options. You know, whether, whether that's a mix of loans or revenue sources and otherwise. And you know, we, we think that this will be enough to start that process and be able to kind of work with all of the partners on that project to pull together a full financing package. Um, you know, it, it is also not a, you know, that, the, the, those 270 and Floyd Hill, you know, we would expect to be, you know, not, not this year, but a couple of years out so that we can go through the planning, work through the financing packages uh, and otherwise. And you know, also given the number of very large projects that are underway right now, part of the theory of the case here, you know, for everything from money to contractor capacity to traffic management is to try and have the next set of big projects ramp up as we're sort of reaching more advanced phases with the large projects that are currently underway on 25, Central 70, and otherwise. Um, the I-70 peak period shoulder lane uh, is the westbound project that is already underway, was needed an additional tranche of funds, so that's what that is. Um, 119, um, I mentioned it is not actually in Region 1, it's part of the Region 4 um, budget, but what that would do is sort of the first down payment on the Carter that you know, we know is a big priority for the US 36 Carter. Um, and then this last item you know, is something that we've worked very closely on with Dr. Cog's staff and we're very excited about and put in here knowing that it both needs future definition and to kind of kick off a process where we will work together to develop it. Um, is, is making a real investment in urban arterial roadways. You know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we have been hearing time and again that there are safety concerns, mobility concerns, state of good repair concerns about these sort of l larger urban roads that are within the CDOT portfolio, but you know, sometimes end up a bit betwixt and between you know, state highways and city streets in terms of how they're treated in the plan. So what, what, the, what this is is sort of the first um, leg of what we hope will become a larger initiative um, to really take these roads seriously and make sure that we're thinking about how they function, you know, both both for going through cities and for living, you know, in urban areas and, you know, make, making them you know, safer for multimodal uses, making them, you know, sa safer for accessing transit for pedestrian use, you know, for driver use. And I think it, it, the idea is not to do road widening on these roads, but rather to think about it from a safety perspective, a state of good repair perspective, and sort of how do we make these roads you know, fit into the places where we live and the kind of densifying urban environments um, that we are kind of working with. So that's a quick snapshot of the um, sort of pro profile of projects that we are proposing you know, for the Dr. Cog area as part of the plan. You know, we, we know that there are projects that are not on this list. Um, 
And a couple of things to that, you know, one, you know, we, we are I, eyes wide open that the amount of funds we have to allocate is real money, but it is certainly not enough to solve all of the problems that we have. And, you know, I think our, in, in some ways, the best success that we could have with this money is to put it to work in a fashion where it will be demonstrably clear what its impact is, show people what you can buy for that much money, and sort of sh vote, vote with its feet in terms of making a powerful case for, you know, the utility that more investment in infrastructure provides. Um, that being said, the next phase of this process, which we, we will be undertaking through the months that follow, um, is to develop this 10-year pipeline of projects, which will be more of the aspirational list. You know, what, what would we do, you know, if hopefully when, you know, more, more funds come into the system and to have sort of a ready vision for how we spend those. And I think we would, we would see that as where a lot of the projects that are missing but also important, you know, fall and would ask everybody to sort of work with us further over the coming months to really think through how, how, how we make that list derive from what we can do in the next couple of years. Um, so with that, anything you want to add, Rebecca? You can take a couple questions if you want. Great. Rocket. Yeah, thank you so much for that. So uh, excited to see uh, 119 on that list. I'm afraid I can't read from here. Oh, uh, what's the funding? A There's a packet. 119 oh, isn't actually in the one in the okay, packet. Okay, so the, what, what, what we're envisioning for 119 is 30 million through the highway pr component and then an additional 10 through the transit. And are you envisioning that as a kind of a, a first amount of funding that'll need to be, uh, basically would it fund a phase or would it just be, hey, we're gonna dedicate this and then later we'll dedicate more and then build something? It's a good question. We are envisioning it funding a phase. Um, one, one of the kind of operating principles here is that we have to show very demonstrable impact with these dollars. You know, we, with the, with the sort of notable exception of the Burnham Yard conversation, we are trying you know, as hard as possible to dedicate as high a percentage of this to sort of results that people will see um, rather rather than the kind of early phases of projects to take a much longer time to bear fruit, which is not to say that it isn't important to buy right of way, to go through planning, et cetera. We all know why those things are important, but if part of the goal is to show impact, you know, from this tranche of dollars, we, we felt that steering more of the resources towards projects that need to happen where it will actually change the way people use the transportation system was sort of the slant that we were looking to take. And to that end, we've been working very closely with the partners on the 119 project to try and define what that first phase is um, and you know, make, make these funds available so that that can happen soon. Great. Thanks. It's exciting. Director Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Director Luke, can you can you talk about timing with these projects? Sorry, I'm uh, over there. I know that these projects both have mm -hmm. the, the time source is limited, and then uh, there's a, a clock with each one of these. So can you kind of connect that to what we have up on the? Sure, it's a good, good question. So several of these are projects that are already underway. So you know, 25 gap, um, 70 peak period shoulder lanes, you know, th those are projects that are happening right now um, that are in need of some funds that they don't currently have. Um, the I-25 piece is the Burnham Yard acquisition where you know, that conversation is happening in real time, but we're not talking about building the project yet. It's you know, sort of a down payment and being able to do it later. Um, the urban arterial safety improvements, we're envisioning that as a, you know, and again, we're still working on what that looks like and the granularity of it very closely. Um, you know, the, I, I will say that the, the Dr. Cog staff really sort of inspired us to turn this turn, turn this idea that we've all been bandying about into a thing. But that will be largely a series of smaller projects. So you know, we would we would hope to see it sort of achieving impact quickly, but throughout the years, and it would be small projects that were sequenced over a cadence. You know, where there would be some each year. Um, 119, we haven't defined exactly what this first phase is yet, so you know, I, I would say that you know, Commissioner Jones and others can kick me if I'm wrong here, um, that that's probably a year or so out because we need a little bit of time to define what the there there is so that we can get it into design and construction. Um, what am I missing? 270, 270 and Floyd Hill are a little bit further down the line for a number of reasons. So Floyd Hill, we just initiated the environmental review, and it, it, it's a big enough project that the NEPA will take a little bit of time. So, kind of getting NEPA done, design by the by the time it's ready for construction, it will be a few years from now. 
Um, 270 is probably a little bit ahead of that, but not much. And the other thing with those two big projects in particular is, as I mentioned before, we're trying to come up with kind of a logical cadence of how many big projects the system can absorb at once. And right now, we actually have a lot of big projects underway, mostly in the metro area. And you know, we think that for a variety of reasons, you know, including, frankly, getting the best price on them, it probably you know, makes sense to have those ramp up as some of the projects that are ramped up right now are ramping down. So we would like to sort of keep that even keeled. Did I miss anything? I think that was it. Director Sandrine. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I think it's great to address all these smaller projects. I think we all did that in the recent TIP program. Um, a couple of questions about the I-25 um, Segment 2 project. We have three times higher crash rate than we did before those express lanes came in, and I don't see that on this list. Um, I'm just curious, if safety is your biggest concern, what are we doing to address that? We know it's been on the larger plan for a while, but it keeps getting moved around. And so when we move forward with this, that is uh, the entry to our city, part of Adams County. We go through multiple cities in that area. So if safety is your number one concern, how is that being addressed? Well, I think safety writ large, a lot of these projects address in different ways. You know, I think with that project in particular, you know, I, you know it, N not every important project is on this list right now because there's a finite number of projects you can do with a finite amount of funding that has to be spread across a lot of areas. You know, I think we would very much like to keep talking about that as we work towards the second phase of determining you know, what, what goes in the pipeline of projects that are not currently funded. You know, I, uh, we couldn't do everything on this list. I guess my question is if, if you've Mm -hmm. taken some of those larger projects and pieced them out like you are with Floyd Hill, was that even an option for I-25? Even piecing them out, there's a limited number of the larger projects you could piece out and still fit them within the sort of schematic that we're working towards. I mean, the, the, there's really only two new big projects that are on this list in part because part of what we were trying to do was, you know, cover as much ground as possible with limited funds and you know, imperfect choices in terms of how you allocate not enough money. And so again, when I go back to safety, those projects that got pieced out, what are their safety ratings compared to ours? We, so it'd be nice, I can't read this on here either. I just can't read it, so I don't have any idea what it says, but it would be nice to see a breakdown of those new projects that you just said, because ours is not new. Right. How do they compare with the safety rating? Because if you're funding a new project and not finishing existing projects, that's going to be a real problem. And our, our citizens are not going to accept that as an answer. All right, Director uh, Binkley. I just, oh, yeah, oh, yeah it's working. Go. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to say something else, but I would like to reiterate, I have been personally affected. I had a student and his father die on I-25 on a year and a half ago, maybe. So um, yeah, it really, it really is an issue. Uh, my original question was, sorry. my original question was, you mentioned before the presentation that um, we're not going to be able to build our way out of this congestion, but, and it's been a long day, so maybe I missed it. I feel like everything that was mentioned was a building project. So are there projects happening that are not just about so building? I, I omitted an important detail, which is that this is not the list of the allocation of the multimodal funds. Um, the, uh, there, there is a pretty significant list of multimodal projects that will be coming. It's going to be a month staggered from this, in, in part just frankly because we didn't want to overwhelm the system such that the multimodal projects didn't get as much airtime as the highway projects. So we, we, we are going to have kind of a similar discussion about allocation of the multimodal funds in at commission next month. Um, so it, uh, it is skewed in the direction of highway projects in part because those funds are just not being discussed in this version, but they will be a month from now. 
you know, I would also add that a lot of these are intended to get into projects that will have co-benefits from a perspective of providing multiple options. You know, certainly the urban arterial improvements are envisioned as a set of investments that would be not just for cars, but for you know, get, getting around via a variety of modes um, in, in the cities that go, in the streets rather, that go through city spaces especially. You know, the, the Colfaxes, the Federals, the Colorados, you know, the, the, the arteries that need to be available for multiple means of transportation in order to have more choice in the metro area in particular. You know, 119, you know, is the beginning of what I think we're envisioning is a BRT corridor. Um, you know, on, on several of these, I, the, you know, the managed lanes would provide a way to have, you know, ki kind of build on the US 36 model where uh, doing a highway project provided us with a way to have a platform for other forms of transportation also. So I, I think, you know, with virtually all capacity projects that we're talking about right now, we're starting from the premise of how do you think about you know, bu building the space so that it's safe and efficient, but being able to layer multiple forms of transportation onto the same space. So I, you don't have a, a good answer for this, and I, I understand that. Um, but I am going to just speak to Jessica's mm -hmm. point just earlier um, about uh, what we're seeing happening off of I-25 and 84th. I was actually late this evening got stuck in another accident. We literally see one at least uh, you know, once a day or every other day on that segment. And um, it, I think safety concern is a little bit of a downplay from what we're seeing and what our residents are seeing, how that segment right there continues to see accidents and it backs up all the way into those northern communities. So um, I'd appreciate if you could uh, take a look at that again. Thanks. Uh, Malika. Anyone else? Yes. To reiterate that same point, I was coming from uh, the north tonight and I had the same issue and I can't help but sit here and think about the comments made by Director Sangren and uh, the increase in accidents and the fact that if safety is a major important piece of this narrative and why it's not included in such a great uh, table as we have listed here. So maybe in future tables we can Any other comments or questions? Yes, Director Jones. Um, recognizing that there's not enough money for all the projects and certainly hear the concerns about I-25, I do uh, think it's a pretty good list. I appreciate having big projects from Region 1 on here as well as um, 119. I'm, I'm intrigued by the uh, urban arterial safety project bucket. I know that we'll have to throw elbows at stack to make sure that the rural areas don't try to take that away, but I think it will be much needed to have a pot for smaller projects that address safety concerns in our communities in the urban areas. So thanks for being creative about that. Thank you, Director Jones. Anyone else? None. Thank you very much, uh, Executive Director Liu and thanks. Director White. Do you have anything else? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Next up is item 14, the annual congestion report, attachment F in your package. Mr. Spots. Good evening, Robert Spots with Dr. Cog. Uh, we're going to discuss our 2018 annual report on traffic congestion. You should each have one of these on your desk. It's an annual report we have we do every year, hence the annual part. Um, you know, we look at the changes year over year uh, on the Dr. Cog's roadways. Um, we're going to talk about that, the federal uh, requirements to do this program, VMT trends. This year, we're taking a look at the past five years. There's been a lot of change, and as we look towards the future, we anticipate even more change. Uh, go over our general traffic congestion measures, and then Steve Cook from Dr. Cog is going to take over and present about incident management and safety in the region. Uh, so quickly, to re remind you, this is a federally required program. We're required to look at the, regi the region's roadways and um, maintain a congestion management process. We do that by through these annual reports and maintaining a database where every regional, regionally significant roadway, uh, we maintain the vehicle miles traveled and levels of congestion amongst other characteristics on those roadway segments. 
So we've been telling this story for a long time where before 2006, you know, VMT was growing at a very stable rate. Starting in 2006, before the recession hit and before gas prices really increased, our VMT started to level off for several years. Um, coming out of the recession and, um, you know, recently th starting in around 2012, VMT started, kind of started to creep up again, um, like we had seen historically, sometimes as, as high as uh, 4%. Um, we thought we might be on some type of course correction or, or, or something. This year, we saw kind of another change to the trend. There, uh, it decreased more than we might have thought, uh, only a 1.1% increase. That was slower than the rate of population grew, um, resulting in our first decrease in VMT per capita that we've seen in about five or six years. You know, this is a good thing for our region. One of our MetroVision targets is to decrease VMT per capita. Our target by 2040 is to get it down to 23. So. Um, in conclusion, I think we're kind of, we're a little uncertain. We, before 2006, we were, we felt like we had a good handle on this kind of constantly increasing VMT. We're entering a period where we're a little less certain about um, the future and VMT growth rates. There's, um, you know, a lot to be said about why this could be happening. As you are all aware, there's just a lot of emerging technologies and changes and options for people in the way they travel. And this could be having kind of an, an unpredictable um, force on, on VMT and VMT growth. To address that, um, you know, one of the programs we have here at Dr. Cog, Mobility Choice Blueprint, um, is taking a proactive choice in how we address and get ahead of these technologies and make sure we have the best policy in place throughout the region to address them. So as um, we look to the future, you know, we'll, I think it's a good to take a look at the past five years and see kind of how we got here. Um, it's kind of hard to remember, but five years ago, 2013, I guess five years ago from 2018, uh, Union Station wasn't even open. We had 40 new miles of railroads, you, you know, US 36, the rapid transit, and um, I-225. You know, there's, there's a huge amount of infrastructure and changes and options for people around the region. Um, in that same time period, we saw about an 8% increase in population, um, and vehicle registrations increased by even more than that. Um, one thing that's changed kind of significantly that we're interested in is a larger share of people are working from home, about a 20% increase in the share of people working from home, and just a lot more activity at DIA, whether that's passing through or stopping here. DIA is growing into even a more major airport. Um, then these, some of these new options, the uh, Ubers and Lyfts, the ride-hailing services, huge increase there. And uh, five years ago, we didn't even have dockless uh, bikes and scooters around our cities. <laughs> um, you know, possibly as a result of these new choices and options, we've unfortunately seen transit boardings decrease by about 3% over that time period. Um, at the same time, um, vehicle miles traveled increased, you know, despite the, our relatively good news this year, over the five-year period, VMT increased faster than population by about 15%, um, resulting in about 6% increase in vehicle miles uh, traveled per capita. Thanks mostly to, to, to technology, um, despite those increases in vehicle miles traveled, we've seen significant decreases in uh, ozone precursor emissions. That's uh, good federal policy requiring that uh, vehicles um, reduce their emissions. Um, greenhouse gas, again, not it, it didn't go down like we would like to see, but um, it didn't increase at the same rate, the 15% VMT rate, again, thanks to those CAFE and Tier 3 fuel standards. Uh, electric vehicles, huge growth in those. You know, there's, so, there's about 300,000 of those out on um, our, in our region right now, but that's about you know 500% increase from where we were five years ago, and we anticipate that to continue to um, increase its, the share of the fleet. Probably the worst indicator out of all of these is the huge increase in fatalities happening on our roadways every year. Something we're all taking very seriously through our, um, you know, we're working on a regional Vision Zero project amongst other things throughout all of your communities. With that increase in, popula or in population and vehicle miles traveled, not the same amount of increase in roadway capacity. We've seen a lot of increases in congestion and I'm sure everyone in this room can attest to that over the last five years. And just kind of another indicator related to all this, um, you know, we've seen a huge change in the way we buy things, and that results in maybe people going to the stores less, but also more freight deliveries and uh, packages being delivered um, and more cargo passing through DIA. 
Really quickly, the, the database we maintain here, um, we, as I said, we, meant, we look at every single roadway segment in the region, and we give each one of them a congestion mobility score. We base that on these four factors here. Severity is how bad that congestion gets during the worst hours of the day. Duration is how many hours throughout the day does it last? Is it just one hour of congestion or is it up to 12 hours or beyond? And then the magnitude, how many people is that affecting? Lastly, reliability, that's gonna have a lot to do with Steve, what he's gonna discuss uh, later on is how many incidents happen on the roadway? You know, congestion is typically fairly reliable. You know that your commute is going to be slower at five o'clock compared to an off-peak hour. But if an accident or a crash or a sporting event or snowstorm can really affect that reliability and increase your travel time. So here's the map, not gonna dwell on this for too long, but the orange line, or the, excuse me, the red lines are the ones we say are the most congested, have the highest mobility scores today in 2018. Um, moving into the future, um, the orange lines are the ones we anticipate to be additionally congested into 2040. It's a lot more congestion. Um, you can reference table one in the report for some uh, more specific numbers, but we do anticipate big increases in congestion moving forward. To address those, you know, these are some recent um, completed and underway projects that are really important in helping us address these. Really big projects that have been completed again in rail, um, lots of stuff happening in bike, pedestrian, and, um, and even roadways and expanding um, lanes to reduce congestion there. This is the, our, our main thing we say here at Dr. Cog and how, how our suite of programs we address congestion by either avoiding it, adapting to it, or alleviating it. You know, these are all the programs we deal with and you, you have in your communities, including the Way to Go program, um, our traffic, traffic signal programs, how we choose to distribute our regional transportation dollars, um, working with communities and helping um, businesses get their employees to work from home. There's a lot we can do and that we're constantly doing in Dr. Cog to mitigate congestion. I'm gonna hand it over to Steve, who's gonna talk about incident management. Okay. the. Key theme for this year's report is incident, incident management, and we've already had a couple of the directors here talk about that uh, on their incidents they encountered to, uh, tonight, and uh, which we face every day. Uh, estimates are that probably half of you know congestion and delays are probably due to various types of incidents. It's not just crashes; it's breakdowns. It's a lot of different things. Um, there's about 200. Uh, reported crashes per day. So those are the ones that are actually reported. Your police law enforcement fills out the forms. Those all get uh, registered with the Department of Motor Vehicle, uh, Department of Motor, uh, Department of Revenue, that's what I meant to say. Um, but there's probably many more minor incidents and breakdowns and things like that that don't necessarily get reported, but that do impact you. Um, the second box here is what we really want to focus on and what's really important. Yes, this is a congestion report. Yes, incidents impact congestion, but the number one issue is the safety of the people at the scene, whether it's people who are in the car or riding their bike or they got injured or the first responders. I mean, we've had too many first responder uh, fatalities and injuries over the last uh, few years, just far too many. That is number one. A side effect of these incidents is increased travel delay uh, that, that people face uh, around the area, of course. These incidents are gonna affect, in essence, you know, the carrying capacity of that roadway. You're gonna have lanes that are blocked. Um, you're gonna have you know, snow incident, you know, which affects, can affect the entire region. That's gonna affect the carrying capacity of those roadways. And even things like rubbernecking uh, even though it shouldn't physically affect, but psychologically, by people driving at different speeds and that, it does affect the capacity of the roadways. And then there's the other impact, which is the diversion of traffic. So you may get too much traffic going onto side streets, onto residential neighborhoods as pe people are following those, or you pull out your phone and look at ways or Google Maps, and then you get a ways jam from people that are following that and winding their way uh, through neighborhoods. We don't want that, or we want that to be very limited um, when those <coughs> incidents occur. Uh, important job, especially for uh, entities such as, such as CDOT, is to get the information out there as quick as we can. Alerts, messages, 
Uh, people can adjust their plans then. So you can look at your phone or look at cotrip.org, uh, maybe leave work a little earlier, a little later, uh, maybe even cancel a trip or use a different mode of travel uh, for that trip if you know there's a major, uh, major incident out there. This is one little cartoon that was uh, put in the presentation here, but it just points out that, you know, we've all probably been guilty at, at times if you're in a long jam, but that's slowing down and having a huge gap as people are looking. That affects both directions of traffic on freeways, not just uh, the incident direction. So one thing, we, one thing we look at is kind of the different elements uh, of that travel delay that you faced on, face on maybe a, a typical trip. So in this example, um, we're just saying that you may have a typical trip that's 18 minutes in the off-peak. So maybe uh, taking your child to a soccer game on a Saturday at 10 a.m. Yeah. might take 18 minutes. No, well then, you know, if they have a game on a Friday night at 5 o'clock and all been through that maybe in the past. That's kind of that peak variation of the day. You can kind of plan on that congestion. You can probably just kind of figure, well, it's gonna take in this case, maybe eight minutes more. It's the normal congestion. It's the reliable congestion, which is pretty reliable sometimes around here. But you can, you can plan for that. These next two items are mostly related to incidents. And that's when you have maybe a moderate uh, somewhat major incident occurring along your route uh, that may add another 10 minutes on the trip for that day. Maybe that happens once a month, twice a month, and then every once in a while you're going to face that extreme incident, you know, a truck that's overturned, and some of these tragic uh, incidents we've had on our freeways uh, in the last couple of years might happen once a year for this particular uh, travel path for this trip. Um, and those are the ones that are really causing that unreliability. It's tougher to predict, and that's why you do pull out your phone before you go to see if there's anything where you may want to change your path or, or cancel that trip for that, uh, for that day. So those are kind of the different elements that we put together and we calculate these out. Um, the incidents can fall generally into two broad types. They're not gonna fit exactly into these. Uh, you may have some that are planned or forecasted. Uh, you, can, you can mobilize your equipment, your snow plows, you can get emergency services ready. Maybe if there's a, for, uh, a snowstorm that's forecast, specific locations ahead of time, you know, a Broncos game. There's all kinds of logistics or some of the events that's at Civic Center Park. Boulder, Boulder, when that's, when that's held every year. Just huge amounts of logistical pre-planning that goes into those, but you, can, you know it's gonna happen, and so you can prepare for that. Uh, sporting events, parades, can be a lot of things. And that's where uh, the staff of your uh, communities and of CDOT and RTD um, can really work, work with law enforcement agencies and everybody involved to plan ahead for these and notify the media and traffic app providers also. Um, what we're really mostly focusing on, on in our report are those unplanned things, crashes, rock falls, landslides, uh, flooding events, debris on roadways. That can be a very important thing sometimes. Emergency road repairs, all right? We've had a couple major ones of those uh, in the last year. It could be a crime scene, vehicle breakdowns, very big thing, and that's where uh, CDOT's uh, State Farm Safety Patrol, they respond to almost 80 a day. I think I looked it up, and it's between 80 and 90 responses a day where they go help people immediately, whether it's uh, filling up their gas tank, or not filling it up, but giving them a gallon of gas if they ran out, or, or uh, doing a, a repair to a flat tire. You and your communities and your first responder staff and your traffic operations staff all have to go through these elements of when a major incidents occur. You know, first there's the call into 911, there's the detection, that's from all kinds of different modes, a lot of it, and we hope more of it in the future will be automated where we have different cameras and technology out there that detects these things even before that 911 uh, call comes in. I mean, there's even programs now of working with uh, Google Maps and Waze to notify 
uh, dispatch centers and 911 centers even before a call comes in, and communities are working with that. Uh, it's posting and notifying, getting the alerts out to people, dispatching the uh, required resources, equipment that may be needed for that uh, level of incident. First responders arrive, mobilize, manage the scene. Uh, you have to monitor off-site impacts, and this is something where some of the new uh, technologies are coming in also in terms of how far back the traffic backups and queues are going. And you want to get the word out way back, you know, of watch out ahead, especially if you're at the crest of a hill, you know, potentially in a rural area. Um, then ultimately removing uh, the incident scene, you know, as far as possible off the road, and then the investigations. So a lot of things involved uh, when incidents occur. Uh, emerging technologies is going to be very important in the future. A lot of this is to prevent incidents as more of our vehicles get connected connected technology by a new vehicle day today there's already certain things in there in terms of lane departure and brake assist but when we get more uh, devices out in the field they're going to be able to help the vehicles communicate with the roadway the vehicle communicate with a vehicle in front of you you know you'll get alerted in a few years you'll get an alert in your car that another car a mile ahead it's airbag deployed or that its brakes were pumped at a certain uh, cadence or pressure, or that the fog lights were turned on. You'll get that word ahead of time, and this is all about getting alerts out there uh, to people. Um, finally, uh, there's some great uh, supporting activities that are going on right now that uh, some of you are involved in. Uh, Doug, I know, is on the uh, governor's uh, uh, task force on responder safety. CDOT coordinates uh, program management teams around the region in terms of working with first responders. Uh, FHWA, Federal Highway Administration, um, offers uh, and encourages local governments to participate in incident management training. And then even uh, legislation, you know, every couple of years there's key uh, incident related or safety related uh, uh, legislation such as this year with the new uh, I-70 mountain corridor uh, traction laws and chain laws uh, and things like that. So with that, we have completed uh, our presentation on our annual report this year. And if there are any questions, Robert and I are, are here. Done? Yep. Okay. So um, safety keeps coming up tonight, um, so that's the topic, I think, across all of these. Um, and so what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing is there was that 56% increase since 2013. And my question is, have we studied or do we have a hypothesis of why that has increased significantly? And where I'm heading with this is how much of it is driver behavior or change in behavior versus can we really, you know, how can we affect that through changing the design of a road or, or, or other things? And of course, you know, I, I think about this. Um, I think about driving under the influence. Um, so what do you know about that 56% and what's truly causing it so that we can look to how do you solve for that? Boy, I wish I had the, the one silver bullet answer there, and it's, it's really all of the above. Right now, uh, both CDOT with its new um, uh, statewide safety plan, they're going through that process. We're going through the Dr. Cog Vision Zero plan. We're looking into that right now, and we have uh, consultants on who are really digging into the data. It's all of those things. And I'm confident we can change it again and get it to dip down. When, it was, when we went from, like I think it was like 2000 through 2008, we had a 50% decline over that period. It's really that around 2012, 2011 period kicked back up again, and that's where that 56% increase is coming from. You know, it's all kinds of things. The distraction of uh, uh, mobile phones or whatever devices that are uh, in vehicles, you know, just aggression out there. Is just, we don't know for sure. 
Um, but these two activities going on right now with the um, uh, Vision Zero Action Plan and the statewide uh, uh, tra traffic safety plan are really delving into these and gonna, are gonna be doing a lot of data analysis over the next couple of months. So if you give us a couple of months, we'll be able to... <laughs> Got out of that. No. <laughs> That it, Director Elrod, you're good? Okay, Director Sutton, is it Sutton? Yes, um, thank you, this is a great report. Um, I, I went to the greenhouse gas inventory thing the other day, and I was really interested in this New York Times map that came out the other day that suggests that since 1990, the Denver region has increased 102% in CO2 emissions, which doesn't seem to jive, that's over 20, 27 years, but it still doesn't seem to jive with only 2% over the last five years. And I'm just curious, if, if we're gonna get serious about climate change and monitoring greenhouse gas emissions, are, are these data consilient? Is it just the fact that they're different ad administrative boundaries? Why are these numbers so vastly different? Yeah, well, number one, you hit on that. It goes back to 1990, um, and so, uh, our population has, got, has, since I looked it up beforehand, our population of our region has doubled since 1980. So since 1990, I think our population has gone up 70%. And with that, number of automobiles. In that report, there's a little bit of apples and oranges in terms of how they did it. They included some other factors in there. I think even aviation might have been in there as the transportation sector which covers many things, construction vehicles and things like that. I can't remember if we looked at one other thing in that New York Times, but certainly a lot more work to do. We completely agree with you that we have a lot more work to do on, on the greenhouse gas front, a lot of which is the fuel use, the use of uh, diesel and gasoline in our uh, internal combustion engines. We're glad to see the electric vehicles going up and. But this was an apples oranges problem. A little bit. Or maybe it's Jonathan Apples and Macintosh. I mean, uh, the, the other <laughs> major effect was the CAFE standards when they were implemented in 2012, I believe. And that had an immediate. The last five years the was last five years were good. Exactly. Right. Okay. Uh, Director Benham. So, uh, just as an alternate uh, point of view. The uh, highest uh, CO2 level that ever occurred on Earth was 8,000 parts per million, but there were no human beings on Earth when that occurred. The highest level that's ever occurred uh, when human beings were present was 4,000 parts per million. Right now, the uh, CO2 level on Earth is 403 parts per million. So historically, CO2 levels are extremely low. If CO2 levels ever went below 150, then all of the plant life on Earth would die because plants uh, have an affinity for CO2. In 1850, the uh, CO2 level went to 182, which was dangerously close to the 150 level. People have uh, calculated that if the CO2 level today went from the present uh, 403 to 600, parts per million, then the value of the extra crops produced would be worth three trillion dollars per year. So in um, 1850, the population of the earth was half a trillion people. Today it's 1.7 trillion. Barring a nuclear warfare or bird flu, whatever, uh, the population will continue to grow rapidly. So uh, reducing uh, the CO2 level is not necessarily a positive thing for humanity. Uh, let me get to Director Teeter and then uh, to Director Murkowski next. Thanks for the presentation. For the people that uh, traveled through Commerce City uh, from the um, north of the south or vice versa, we have four major intersections where you have to cross two different sets of tracks. Uh, what Commerce City is looking into now is, and we are going to invest in this next year, is we are going to place monitors at the railroad tracks, and then at the, let's say, I-76 or Highway 2 is where the sign is going to be, and it's going to let the travelers know mm. that uh, the tracks are blocked. So this is something we're looking at, and uh, we'll probably do it next year. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Director Rakowski. 
I applaud Director Elrod's comment. Drivers, and that's the one thing we talk about: quality of driving. Not all drivers are equal. We assume in all planning they are. Focus problem still happen for vehicle man driving. Thank you. Uh, Director Brockett. Well, I mean, we, I don't think we probably want to have a whole climate change debate this evening, but Director Vape, I, you know, I just, maybe you might share your, your facts with the board at some point, because a, a quick look at graphs on Google does uh, not support the large numbers you were talking about in the last few thousand years. So uh, just maybe send us something. Any other questions or comments, Director White? Um, I just wanted to add a, a compliment. I think this report is great. Um, it's so nice to see this snapshot of the metro area. Um, I also appreciate the focus on safety tonight. I think this is one of the many areas where Dr. Cog and CDOT can work closely together. Uh, so that our mission is so aligned and what we want to try to achieve for this area. Um, I thought the, the video that was shared a couple months ago on Vision Zero was very powerful. And I've shared that with our team. And I think to Dr. Elrod's point, it's the built environment, it's operations and behavior, and we have to be tackling all three all at the same time. Thank you for the conversation. Other questions or comments? I will. Ha I have a few actually. One, um, you know, the Tim's program, the traffic incident management, is a p very powerful thing that a lot of communities uh, use and leverage. In fact, I think of. Uh, Greenwood Village, when you shut down a freeway, what it does to a community and how we respond to it and the impacts and the pollution and everything associated to that quality of life and that safe travel, we should all have a right for safe travel through our communities. So it's important that all our communities support the TIMS program. Leading into the TIMS program, I also want to applaud Douglas County, mm -hmm. who partnered with CDOT to create the TIMS track. And that is a place for first responders and CDOT employees and even your employees to learn about TIMS and how to clear an accident safely and responsibly. So I think that's another applaud to Douglas County forward thinking and working with CDOT to put uh, one of its, I think it's one of the few in the area, I believe. But if you want to schedule time on the track, call Douglas County is my understanding. And the last thing we should also do to, to reinforce what Director Rakowski was saying you know, education, education, education. Uh, you, you know, I don't know how much we can do about how we can teach, you know, just dumb drivers, but the, the, good, the, the thing we can do is Dr. Cog and other organizations, but mostly Dr. Cog is creating good videos, and we have all channel eights and we all do online streaming. I would encourage Dr. Cog staff to, and our staff to get a hold of those videos and circulate those through our channel eights and at all means possible to communicate about Mission Zero and all of the other good programs that Dr. Cog does around all these topics. So, you know, that's something we also need to keep uh, thinking about to continue to communicate, communicate, educate. Uh, there was somebody who, does somebody else have a question? Jack? Go ahead. That's fine. If you'd like to just go up to the microphone. City of, oh, there we go. City of Broomfield, uh, council member. And I wanted to ask and possibly even challenge in regards to talking about transportation in this regional area that we put a lot of focus on um, how to get the people to their jobs for the most part. Um, maybe we should shift that because our funding is really low. First mile, last mile is almost unaffordable and take the jobs to the people. And we have a lot of B corporations and corporations in this area that have very large campuses and possibly working with them in some test programs to try to get satellite offices. So similar to how our shopping is changing, um, we're, we're big boxes going out and they're looking at other ways to get to consumers. We should probably look at our transportation issues very similar. Our society's changing. We've got amazing infrastructure and internet and communication. 
So possibly in the future, look at working with these corporations to take the jobs of the people and keep the people in a regional area instead of crossing town for their jobs. Thank you. I would say telecommunication is, or telecommute is a great option. I think half my family does work from home for corporations from all over the world. So, I mean, good economic driver for some people just to stay at home and work from home. And now you have a person that makes some money that stays off our roads and spends their money locally. Um, any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you very much. We're moving right along to number 15, update on the regional transportation funding attachment G in your packet, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, I know the time is getting late here, and but we do want to give you a quick update on on uh, some conversations that we've had and where where this all is appears to be headed or at least what's uh, what's happened since the last time we talked together. Just to remind you all, the conversation that we had back in July was related primarily to the concept of um, empowering uh, existing MPOs and the possibility of creating a tool in legislation giving uh, them taxing authority. So, um, and I know, you know, we've had conversations, whether that be related to the actual tool itself that, um, that could be created in statute, and we've also had conversations about you know, the, some the f a framework related to a ballot initiative. So what we would really like to do from staff's perspective is kind of decouple those two um, and really just concentrate on the tool itself and have a discussion about the value that that might provide in some future year. There's, po you know, in, of course, having the tool does not, does not mean that it will ever be used, right? It's someone, I talked, who was it, Director? Dyack earlier today talked about, you know, like any golfers out there, you have a four iron. It doesn't mean you want or ever will use that four iron, but you know you got it in the event that you do, right? It's just adding to that tool chest in the events in some future year that um, this is something that uh, the board might, might want to consider. So with that said, and, and Ron's going to say a few words about that a little bit later, but I just wanted to get you up to speed on a few of the meetings we've had since the last time we, went, we met. So we did meet with uh, uh, Speaker Casey Becker um, in early September and had a conversation about the concept. Um, we had a very good discussion. Um, she, um, uh, we particularly, we had a good discussion about the necessity to have some kind of hold harmless language in there so we can, we can uh, assure that the, the level of investment that's currently made in our region by CDOT and others um, remains so if we were ever to do a, get the legislation and actually do a ballot initiative and actually be successful. So um, we, we highly agree with that. There is current language within the Regional Transportation Authority statute right now specifically dealing with hold harmless language, so I would assume that any future lang language associated with this EMPO concept would have that as well. Um, so uh, I, on, September on September 16th um, at the TLRC meeting, the Transportation Legislation Review Committee meeting, um, draft, uh, bill drafts were requested, and Senator Winter uh, proposed one to explore this EMPO concept. Um, there were, uh, Senator Priola and Representative Gray spoke in favor of this, um, and but there were some other concerns, of course, as expressed by others. There was really no specifics that were mentioned um, with regards to this, and even Senator Winter admitted that there were some there were some issues that would have to obviously be resolved as, um, associated with this. So once I found this out, this was news to all of us. We didn't realize that this, this request was gonna be asked. We, um, we scheduled a meeting with Senator Winter and Representative Gray, who are, uh, um, who are transportation chairs respectively in the Senate and House to have a conversation further about this. And at that meeting, and I'm, I should say, I should also ask, I mean, Bob, Chair Pfeiffer, he has been a trooper with this and, and going to all these meetings with us, that we made it quite clear what the board position or isn't right now with regards to this. It's just a concept that we're exploring, and they understood that. Um, they uh, Part of the reason why they decided to pull a bill title on this is because there were other legislators that had expressed an interest in titling this and, and pulling a bill title, and um, they wanted to be able to control the fate of, of the conversation. So that's, that's basically why they did that. Um, so let me see. So... <clears throat> 
So the so there is some language that's out there now for TR, TLRC discussion. It is one of their eight bills that they are considering because TLRC can can carry forth up to five. Is that right? Yeah, up to five bills. Um, it's not anticipated at this point that that it it will be one of their TLRC bills. Um, that we did receive the language late last week. It's uh, based. It's it, it found. At least the drafters thought the best location for it would be in um, the RTA statute. So it's basically it's an acceleration for uh, of the RTA statute. Because so right now in statute, in order for an RTA to form, the 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 parties that are wanting to form the RTA, they have to get um, the approval of their councils and then ultimately all sign on to an IGA. This language, to the best that we can determine, would, um, through resolution, an MPO could establish that concept. It obviously still would require a vote of, uh, vote of the people to establish it ultimately to authorize the, the, the RTA, and then there would have to be a separate question associated with um, funding it. Ron, I'm, I'm, you're not glaring at me, so I think I kind of got that right. <laughs> Um, which, which is great. No, <laughs> he's all all eyes. Um, so we still we obviously have a lot of a lot of questions about the language. This is so rough right now. But I, I think there there was some value in getting that because one you know could it be done in statute right? And um, I now granted I don't know you know I don't think a lot of legal eyes have been on it yet to, to determine if that's the the appropriate place, but. Um, we thought the RTA statute made some sense. So we're going to continue those discussions. And I'm just going to turn it to Ron real quick um, to, in case he has anything to add because he knows more about this legislative stuff than I do. Put a mic in front of me. I'll never turn down the, the option. Um, thanks, Doug. I, I think you know what we thought was important tonight was make sure we're not getting too far out ahead of the board. I think in previous briefings and conversations with the board, um, we've gotten the head nods from you all to continue these conversations, exploring this. I think given what we're hearing and the level of interest, not just on the legislature side, but other stakeholders, other interest groups, other MPOs around the state, um, in fact, um, I, I think we felt it was important to circle back and make sure that we're still okay with you all to continue those conversations um, so that we're at the table because things are starting to take off a little bit. And um, I know that before there's any formal position by this board um, in support of any real legislation that obviously will come back under our legislative policies. Um, but we want to make sure you're still comfortable with us, at least to continue to engage in these conversations um, as draft legislation is being developed, um, which uh, did catch us a little off guard at this point. But uh, we think it's valuable for us to continue to be at the table. I think it's also really important, as we mentioned in the staff report, that you know enabling legislation, if that's achieved, um, this legislative session or any other time is not a commitment on the part of this board to ever utilize that tool and that there is a whole host of future conversations and decisions that the board would have to make um, before ever kind of taking the final action to actually employ the tool and ask the voters for any funding and those include sort of what funding, what, what tax or fee structure, what rate, how much, what the uses of that would be, what the governance and decision-making structure. So I just want to um, kind of wanted to reiterate to the board that there's a lot of conversations still to have, but we do think from our perspective that it's important for us to continue to be at the table and influence those discussions that are starting to happen um, around this concept. See, I told you he's better than me on this stuff. But, and, but he is right, though. I mean, and I'll be frank with you guys. There's, there's, there's other groups that are pushing this legislation. Um, and they're a little ahead of us. And quite frankly, we felt a little stifled in our ability to react to some of that based on the direction that we've had from this board. So, um, so, so really, I mean, I think it is truly important that we remain a stakeholder and at that table because ultimately it, it has effect on, on us. So we, we just wanted to be as transparent as possible about, about where we are and where likely this is headed. Here's, here's my thoughts on this, since I've been working with the, the staff a little bit on this and the, at the state. I, you saw the mayor. The mayor caucus is very involved with this. I don't know if your mayors have talked to you, um, but 
they were instructed to, my mayor was, was telling your mayors to talk to you about this. And so what my concern is, is that the mayors have influenced something at the Capitol uh, for us to move forward on the M EMPO, which is which is great. It's just a tool. And that's all we're talking about. But we better be at the table for dinner, or we are the dinner. And I'd really, I'd really <laughs> hate to see that we would go in opposition of something that was put together, that was looked like it was for Dr. Cog, but yet Dr. Cog opposed it. So it, it's it's a really it's a weird jam we're in. And I would encourage you to talk to your mayors uh, to see where they're at. They haven't made a position just yet, but. There's some insight there, and I think it's important that staff is at that table. Uh, Director Jones. Some of us don't have mayors, oh. and uh, <laughs> fair enough, I, fair enough. I'm a little concerned that the county, the county forum for this is seems to be this table, and uh, nothing against the mayors or the Metro Mayor's Caucus, but I feel like the staff are really driving this conversation pretty hard. So I'm counting on you all to make sure that they don't get too far ahead of us. And I, I, I appreciate you all continuing to check in, and I don't want to keep repeating the same thing every time you check in, but I feel like if I don't, then perhaps I, I don't want a silence to be interpreted differently. Boulder County is still not sure we would ever um, support using this fine with exploring it. We are definitely exploring internally whether or not we should go to the ballot at the county level. So no surprises um, there. Um, just wanted to continue that cautionary tone. No, Director Jones, I appreciate that. And 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 yes, you're you're correct. I know there are a number of folks that number of communities that are that are exploring the, the possibility of going out and um, and again I think it truly is it is about the option, the tool, right? It, this might not be the appropriate time in the next two, three years, even do it. You know, I think what it does do, it provides an opportunity for some future board, whether that be 20 years, we don't know what the political environment will be, then we always talk about what if we had, you know, this enabling, some X enabling legislation, right? Well, this sets it up for us and others to use at some future date. And it's like Ron suggested, the conversations associated with a ballot initiative, whether you know we ever get to that point of even having that discussion will be lengthy and there will be, there's so many issues associated with that that we would have, have all those bridges we would have to cross that um, you know there, there will be plenty and ample conversation. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Are we good with staff sitting at the table? I'm getting some head nods. All right. Thank you. We're good with that? All right, let's move on. Committee reports. We could blaze through these. From the State Transportation Advisory Committee, Director Jones. Um, the stack heard the same presentation we heard from Director Liu on the planning process update and um, we had the same conversation about how to spend the SB1, 262, and 267 funds. Um, beyond that, uh, we also got an update on the Senate Bill 239 emerging mobility uh, process that's going on. Um, that process is going to yield recommendations by November 1st on a fee structure and other recommendations um, for TNCs and other commercial vehicles like Uber, Lyft, um, taxis, that kind of thing. Um, and that will be an important uh, process to see how we move, whether or not we move forward with something like a VMT user fee. So stay tuned on that. And then last but not least, um, they're doing some updates to the CDOT budget to make it better aligned with the 10 year um, uh, planning horizon that they're moving towards. So we got a preview of that. Thank you, Director Jones. Next up, the Metro Mayor Caucus, since we just brought them in. Uh, yeah, uh, Director Starker. Thank you. Uh, the uh, Metro Mayors met in October. We had a, uh, a briefing on the Metro Growth Initiative, 109-122. We had a, a good uh, uh, briefing by uh, Brad Calvert from Dr. Cog on the Metro Vision and the Mile High Compact retrospective. Interesting. A presentation there, very well done. We had a um, 
report on Mobility Next. We uh, discussed Proposition CC and DD coming to the ballot and subsequent to the meeting, the uh, Metro Mayors uh, reached consensus to uh, support both of those um, ballot initiatives. We had a report on the 2020 Census, the complete count coming to your city, and we had a discussion and a report back on EMPOs from our mayor from Arvada. Thank you. Isn't that funny? <laughs> uh, my mayor didn't talk to me yet, so. Uh, so, uh, Director uh, Baker, you want to go ahead and do the Metro Area County Commissioners? Yes, I will. Um, I don't think we had a report last month, but on August 23rd, we met in Jefferson County at the Evergreen Fire Rescue Station to talk about wildland, wildfire, and urban interface. Um, on September 20th, we were supposed to meet in Douglas County hosting a tour of Sandstone, Stan, Sandstone Ranch. That was canceled because only three commissioners signed up to attend. We're meeting this month, October 25th in Denver as the host to our, for our second part on mental health. The MAC, M-A-C-C, did not discuss EMPO at any point. <laughs> <laughs> Because you have, it's probably because you don't have a mayor. Oh, we don't have mayors. mayors. Exactly. That's what we've learned. <laughs> oh next, uh, next up, uh, Air advisory committee on aging. Jayla's not here, so I think we're going to skip over that one. Yep. And then the report on the regional air quality council from Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple briefings at that meeting. We had the 2019 ozone season end end of year review. Um, actually, our ozone. Our ozone uh, was pretty good, and, and relatively speaking, we still blew uh, one of the monitors that within our region. But uh, overall, it was uh, it was a vast improvement over over previous. Um, we had an overview of the regional haze program and the Rocky Mountain National Park nitrogen deposition reduction plan. I won't say any more about that because I don't know much about it. <laughs> but it was interesting, I must say. And um, we also um, amended some bylaws associated with the, with, with the Regional Air Quality Council. Um, uh, it's been a long time since there's been any amendments to those, some operational stuff associated with the agency. So it was, it was, it was good stuff. Thank you. I think on the next one, we should stick with the Price is Right theme and say next up for bid is the E-470 Authority. <laughs> I'm getting awful chippy in here, isn't <laughs> Sorry. it? Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. Nine billion dollars. Uh, uh, E470, Director Dyack. All right. Uh, we have had two meetings since we last met. Uh, we, we, we did an easement uh, uh, for Parker Water and Sanitation. Uh, they're building a uh, water line uh, through the E470 right away. Uh, we talked about finance. We talked about uh, how Fitch upgraded uh, our, our debt to A. That's a two notch increase. So that has come um, very, very far since the early 80s and the early 90s, which we were, we were borderline investment grade. Uh, we also talked on the 26th about a commercial vehicle toll rate restructure. Um, we're looking with our consultants uh, to see if we can maybe optimize our toll rate structure for commercial vehicles. That will potentially drive some more of that traffic to E470 and alleviate some of those other roads around the region. And then on uh, the 10th, we talked about um, budget workshop. Um, so uh, we, we uh, expect a 3.8% increase in, uh, in, in toll traffic. So I think that's the highlight. Everything's going very well. And uh, I, I think we've had a, uh, some, uh, some news in what, nine news is what it was? Yeah, it was on, nine news. Yeah, they, uh, a, an entity, a Canadian entity um, spoke to Aurora um, the, the E-470 board has a, a policy to not accept uh, unsolicited proposals. And uh, this, this firm is trying to um, uh, get traction on a unsolicited proposal. So if there is a point in time where we do entertain options, uh, we will go out to bid and uh, ask everyone, not just one person. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions for E-470? Moving on to Fast Tracks, uh, Bill Van Meter. So at their October meeting of the Fast Tracks Capital Programs and Planning Committee at RTD, the board heard an update on the North Metro or N-Line progress on construction and towards 
opening and in response to a number of concerns and communications with elected officials in the corridor, um, we've started providing, the, our general manager, Dave Genova, started providing regular updates to North Metro or N-Line elected officials, um, starting with that update that we presented to our board. Same night, we also uh, addressed additional and provided our board with additional information on the fast tracks initial unfinished quarters report that I referenced previously here, providing more insight as to the 23 different financial and funding options that RTD presented to our board as part of that report. Just a little more information on each option, a description for our board of what authority, if any, would be needed, including federal, state, or voter for the various types of financial initiatives to help complete fast tracks that they may consider in the future. Our GM also informed the board that in early October, RTD received a letter from the BNSF Railroad with their analyses and modeling for the B-Line peak service plan to Boulder and Longmont. No pricing in that, in that, but we consider that a very good sign that BNSF actually has engaged RTD in a discussion on that peak service plan and um, has formally responded to our requests for information and staff is reviewing it. Although, don't ask this staff, I haven't seen it. Finally, the same evening at our um, communications and government relations um, um, board meeting, our board heard an update on the Empower MPO. Um, and although there were no mayors, mayors in attendance <laughs> at that meeting. That concludes my report. <laughs> Get over the <laughs> All right. <laughs> Next meeting is November 20th. Uh, and then any other matters from the members? Yes, uh, Director Walton. Thank you. I just want to uh, make sure everyone knows November 5th is Election Day. Good luck to anybody who's on the ballot. Hopefully I'll see you at the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Rex, be sure to vote. Real quick before we turn, how many are going for re-election? You raise your hands. So maybe a third. Yeah. So. So. Okay. How many folks? Oh, one last question. Sorry, I know we are late. How many people are going to NLC for the cities that have mayors going to NLC next month? Just one. Okay. Okay. Again, good luck for those that are running for re-election, and we'll see you next month. Have a safe Halloween. Good luck, man. <laughs>